Click the button. Uh, so now we are live. This is great. Um, so what's up, Lucky Lex, and welcome. Good, I'm good. Welcome to the show. My name is Holden Stefan Roy, and this is Bridge the Gap, the show where we talk to super interesting people such as yourself and we walk through your life and we extract knowledge nuggets from your experience while learning all the stuff that you'll never find on google because psh, i don't know if you've tried googling people but believe it or not there's not often a lot of good details out there um so just to get like started with it can you just let us know just real quickly where you were born like where you start your life I'm born in uh, Montreal. I'm born in Montreal uh, from uh, Francophone parents, but uh, my parents divorced like before I was one year old, and my mom then was with a New Yorker till I was five, and we traveled around the world. We went to, well, all around the States. She had an import-export business, so we went like India, Afghanistan, uh, Switzerland, France, uh, Ibiza, Spain, uh, Morocco. Uh, this uh, I was like... A hippie baby, you know, like a cotton diaper, long blonde hair, and uh, so I grew up in the world, you know, and I grew up um, very much in the English upbringing yeah. because of my stepdad. Yeah, this is a fantastic segue into my like first opening question because it, it requires a little bit of context like that so that people know what we're talking about. But I'm gonna ask it. It's a little bit of a story, and then when it lands, we're gonna we're gonna explore what you just said with more detail. Um, so it kind of starts with my girlfriend and uh she's washing the dishes and she's got her phone playing that black eyed piece song that i got a feeling Ooh. You know, she's like bopping around she's vibing she's doing her thing um and i'm watching her and i'm thinking about this song right because it's like chores music right it's that it's, it's exercise music now that's what yeah. this song has become in our lives and i started thinking about how just a decade ago we were all in the club super drunk dancing in circles to that same very song and the context of that song in our lives was just completely different it was just like the party song the fun night when you're out and escaping reality and then it became the song when you embrace reality which is just super interesting to me how the same song over the course of a decade changed its role inside of our lives so yeah. drastically and that music can evolve over time in such a way in the same way i started thinking about all the cardi b's and stuff and all the people in the clubs and how they don't even know it yet but they're going to soon be doing dishes to these same very songs <laughs> and then i yeah. found out just everybody's doing dishes to these songs already it's just already what's happened so everything that's a club banger is a dishes song just nobody really knew that um with that it made me think about our own musical journeys, right? Because, like, songs have their journeys, and that means we have to have our own journeys, and that means we evolve and all this stuff in the kind of the same way the music does. And I find that, like, where most people talk about their musical upbringings and stuff, they start in, like, that adolescent era when they're, like, forming their identity and start picking the different things that they like. But really, like, yeah. our musical journeys don't start there. They just start when we're born because there's always going to be some level of music around us in our lives. Um, yeah. Like I can remember being like four or five years old and my dad's got all these gray boxes, the amp and the radios and the tape decks and everything. And they're like put together with wires and the speakers are all around the house. And he would bust those Led Zeppelin tapes of his yeah. and whatever else he had there at nighttime. It was the nineties MC Mario music styles of the EDMs and whatnot. Um, yeah. My mom's was into like discos and tech or musicals. It wasn't my favorite, but she was into her vibes and whatnot. At Christmas yeah. time, we'd have like this this EDM remix of Christmas Bangers album that got played only on Christmas Day type. So like <laughs> music just has all these different things in our lives, and they're just so like pivotal to who we end up becoming as artists so much later on. And I think hearing your music now and hearing how worldly your inception is. It could definitely be say that there might be some influences to your early upbringing and the sounds you heard into everything that came later. So I'm hoping you can bring us back to well, as many of these early memories as you can bring us through where you can describe like what it's like to be you with the sounds and just going around the world and just seeing these different cultures so young. Like you must have been exposed to so much shit. Yeah, that's it. Well, first of all, a funny story. Uh, my mom, so she came from Saguenay, uh, 500 K is north of uh, Montreal. So when she was, uh, she's born in 56, I think. So she was like uh, an adolescent in the 60s. 
she was like a groupie, you know? There wasn't a lot of live shows that would go up there. So she she started following this guy uh, that had this cover band. He would just go on all regions, you know, to the farthest, farthest regions. He was a guy from Montreal, but would go up there and play whatever, the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, all the popular stuff. And they, they would never hear, like, Anglophone stuff, you know, live. So she fucking fell in love with the, the, this band, started following this guy everywhere, and he was a cousin of my father. So that so, I, I, so I'm kind of like the, the whole origin. I mean, I'm born in music, you know? And then traveling, of course, you're exposed to, to food, man. I'm a chef. You're exposed to all these, these foods, man, in India, Morocco, all that, these spices, and these rhythms, all different, very different than American rhythms. And then I moved, uh, so that was in, as a baby, I, I'm imprinted for that. And then I moved at five years old to Miami. And this is like beginning of the 80s. My, my first love for music on my own, like I, I want this cassette, it was Thriller. Like I'm old, man. I'm, a, I'm 44, man. I've been doing, since 2000, I've been doing my own original music. I had many bands. And not doing cover, but really original music since 2000. I'm old school. And uh, I fell in love with fucking, like, the Thriller and uh, and uh, Michael Jackson because it was so huge. And as a child, I was just so impressed how, how he can embody music as well physically as, as, as every, everything about him was, was music. There was a movement to every note, you know? And then the first show I, I saw was coming back to Montreal at six years old. My first show was the Jackson Victory Tour. That was the, the farewell tour of the Jackson 5 because Thriller was so big that they had to, like, close that door and put the energy on, on MJ, you know? But uh, that was my, that's my earliest memories, man. And you uh, want to... I'll, I'll close this story... I'll close this story with an incredible fucking moment in my life, okay? And this is one of these stories people don't believe. So my mom's kind of like a hustler. She's a cute woman, and we have a fucking ticket up in the uh, in the seats. But we, she goes to the floor. She talks to the first security, second security. We go on and on and on. We end up like six, seven row of the Olympic Stadium, Jackson, the farewell tour. And there's one available seat. My mom asks this this big man if I can sit on his on his his knees. And we're so we're like six row. My mom's sitting there. It's not like we don't have tickets for this. And I'm on this big man, and I'm just watching the show, the lights. I've never seen a show, you know. And then it's the breakdown. It's the Michael Jackson part of the the Jackson Five. So he does his solo stuff, and he does his whole dance routine. At the end of his dance routine, I fuck you not. He does like three, four turns on himself. He takes his fucking hat, and knowing him, I don't want to go into fucking like some obscure shit, but knowing how much he had, you know, love for youth and all that, he probably always spotted someone young when he, he, he threw the hat. He throws the fucking hat. I'm not joking you. Time stops. This is one of my earliest memories. I just see fucking the lights, the spotlights, and the fucking hat coming towards me, coming towards me, coming towards me. The guy I'm sitting on grabs the fucking Michael Jackson's hat, and he looks at me like a Disney movie, and, like, is going to give it to me, Two rows behind him, some guy jumps on him. I fucking hit the floor. My mom grabs me. These fuckers start fighting. Security stops them. They get expelled from the show. I never get the hat. But for me, that was a blessing, man. That's a, one of my earliest memories of my life. And that, seeing that show and that, the lights and everything, I was like, wow, I want to be an artist. I want to be a performer. And for me, that was a benediction. That was a sign, you know? So that, that's some crazy shit. Yeah, that, that's a... <laughs> that that's amazing i wasn't expecting you to be involved in an altercation at a jackson five show because michael wanted to give you the hat <laughs> definitely was not how i expected it to start but that's excellent so already you're like let's say six seven years old or whatever <clears throat> yeah like five, and six, yeah. you've traveled to more countries than most of us you've lived in more cities than most of us uh well not most most of us but you've lived in a few cities and like you managed to go see your first show, which is pretty incredible. And and not even like in the nosebleeds and shit. No, like right up front. That's serious. Uh, you, that's a blessing that you even got to see the Jackson Five like that, because you know everything sure, changes man. after that, man. Sure. So so when you say that gave you the bug to become a performer, then did you start like doing your like at home performances, and did you like evolve into like singing or something? I like always. That? 
I always, from that point, uh, so this is like my, I'm five, six in my earliest memories. Uh, I remember I, I was like, uh, I, it, if I was born like 20 years later, they would have gave me Redolin and shit. I was a, like a ADD. I, I was, I could not concentrate in school more than 30 seconds. I just zone off and play with my whatever. I'm out in space, you know. And so I remember that uh, the bathtub was a big thing for me. And I was always inventing songs that I remember that I wasn't so much into like repeating the songs that the, the traditional baby songs and shit. So I remember I would always invent shit. And I had this fantasy also of uh, breathing underwater. So I would kind of like pu push myself to keep my breath. And then I would come back and I, I would fucking invent these songs in the bathtub. And then when I got the, my, my first babysitter, he was a, a kid like uh, 16, right? He had a grand piano. And I remember him uh, playing uh, Elise. Uh, -na 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 -na. And I really liked that, that as a child. And I remember inventing lyrics to that, you know? Like the little dog, he went to see the cat, and then the cat, he said hello. And I was like fucking like six, eight years old, you know? So for me, like inventing my own music was natural as a child. All right. So you were already getting into your freestyle songwriting game at like six post Michael Jackson because it just kind of went down that path. And now, but on top of that, you have like the kid imagination and play adding like story elements to it that's like super nifty man like super nifty so as you're going through this <clears throat> do you like what do you have to do you draw or anything like that as well were you going down that path were you like a multi-artist kid or was it more like you were just focused on the music it was really more music i, I didn't i didn't draw a lot it was more like just like crazy stories at one point i wanted to be an inventor so i kind of drew stuff i didn't know how to draw <laughs> but uh no, it was just I wanted to create my own things. That was the focus, and it was music. It was really music. That always spoke to me until this day. That's, for me, the best way to communicate with human beings is music, you know. So as you're going through, you're back in Montreal at this point. Yeah. Montreal. What, what part of Montreal are you growing up in? Uh, right, right now, uh, uh, at that point, I mean, I came back to uh, Montreal. I was like eight or nine. I stayed like three years in Miami, started school there in English, and I came back to Montreal. And I would do the, um, for my whole adolescence, uh, childhood adolescence, uh, back and forth between Montreal and uh, Saguenay, where my mom's family comes from. So I, back and forth, the small town, the bigger town, you know, so that was my experience. That must, uh, what's that like? Like, so like, how, how, like, you would spend like the summers in one place, or was it just like... Oh, I mean, the, my my uh, I moved a lot. My, my I moved a lot. My situation was the most stable after the states. So I I lived with my grandma and stuff. It was kind of weird in the small town because, like, literally in those years in the eighties, end of the eighties, uh, no one spoke English, and I, my mind was like an anglophone, but my family was francophone, and I was living in francophone environments. And uh, because of the one hundred one uh, law, I couldn't go to English school. So I, I, it was hard. Like it was hard to. To switch my mind to French, and and to this day I I dream in English, you know. So the the language is for me was always I, I really felt that that whole like battle that language thing in Quebec that we we, we go through. So yeah, but it's it a was, real thing. It was great. I mean, I have a great family and a great mother, and a, had a nice upbringing overall. Yeah. Um. So as you're growing up with it, um. <laughs> When you're inventing songs, do you like get into musical instruments or production, or do you start dubbing stuff? Like, tell us a bit more about like how you get into music more like seriously. Yeah, so that's it. So uh, after like the states, I, my mom was listening to a lot of like Motown and stuff like that at those years, the end of the eighties. Then I come back to uh, Quebec in the nineties, in this little town in Chicoutimi, uh, was a lot of metalheads. So that for us to like a young preteen teen. To kind of find my 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 things that I want to listen to, not my mom's shit and stuff, or what's on what's on the radio. Of course, I got into whatever was popular and doing fuck uh, Vanilla Ice, MC Hammer, whatever. And uh, oh, fucking Run DMC. The one thing was like preteen and all that. I went to my first little teeny parties, and it wasn't so like uh, it wasn't like oh, there's we wouldn't label as much as today. It wasn't like, oh, this is rock, this is that. It was kind of like, it's music and it's good. So you go to a party and be like, Samantha Fox, and then it'd be a song by Run DMC, 
and then it'd be fucking Bon Jovi, and then it'd be a song, whatever. BC. It was all mixed up, so that was kind of cool that we were exposed to a lot of shit. I didn't know. I was listening to hip hop, and I, I didn't. I, I, the first really song I got into was Mary Mary from fucking uh, Run DMC. But I didn't know it was hip hop, you know. And then I got really into to metal because that was like uh, like some rebel shit, you know. And I, I really got into electric guitar and uh, metal, yeah, for sure. So you started playing. Um, you started playing guitar. Yeah, I'd say around uh, 15, 15 I got a, and I didn't want to acoustic i went straight to electric and yeah i started buying the books of tablatures of by the by the age of like 16 oh, one year into it i was pretty much obsessed by slayer I was, well, so you had to buy tab books yeah there was no internet yeah it's like i i have like a kind of i started playing bass in 2000 and like six or something so at that point there's like cyber fret that's giving you lessons and like yeah. all this shit that's available for it so how do you teach yourself to play bass back then? Or guitar, sorry. Well, I was just, I had some small courses, like kind of some small courses. And uh, then I just kind of figured out how to uh, read tabs. And then I just kind of just listen and practice, listen and practice, you know. I, I, yeah, at one point, I said it was like Slayer, you know. So I had, I bought the fucking uh, BC Rich guitar. I, I put the ESP pickup on it. I got the, the Marshall Valva State. I, I wanted the same setup, you know, and I, I kind of wanted to become that kind of guitar player and a, those kind of like really fucking gnarly, kind of hellish, really crazy technical soul, cr solos and, 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 and the practicing my, this is my picking and being fast and all that. But uh, I was really into skateboarding also and snowboarding, so I, I guess I... I I didn't become as good as I wanted to into in guitar, you know. I put a little more energy at that point as an adolescent to skateboarding and snowboarding too. So how'd you get into that? <clears throat> so I come back to Montreal. Like this is like uh, third grade of high school. I have long hair and uh, metal T-shirts and shit. I get to the school and everyone is kind of pretty straight and, and nerdy and whatever. I'm trying to find people, you know. And then uh, there's no people with long hair and all that, and uh, uh, no one listens to metal. But there's like free skate. This is before skateboarding was really popular, so that was kind of another reject thing. But uh, there was free kids that were skateboarders, and they kind of had like the Tony Hawk, like half shaven with the, the the long hair. And I don't know. I started hanging out with them, and pretty soon I had bought in a bought a skateboard, and we, we just it was fun because it was so free. We could just do it anywhere, you know. It, there wasn't so much skate parks back in, in those days. And that was a big part of my, my youth because that also was kind of like, well, it's freestyling. It's, it, it's expression and in, in movement in your whole body. And, and also, I really learned to, like, uh, put much more effort than in guitar because, like, you're, you're kind of two or three people and you're, you can do the same move over and over and over again for five hours straight. Maybe you're just going to land it once, but... To kind of, that really built my character to like, I, I got to do. I you be kind of obsessive in your work ethic, and you, I got to do this. I got. I cannot go home till I do this. You know, so that that yeah, that was a big part of. So you're saying that having the other people with you with the skateboarding added that level of accountability to it. Well, yeah, we encourage each other. And we, we we're such <laughs> a small little tight like brotherhood, but it was like okay, well, I'm trying this move. I'm trying this move, and it's kind of like. We, we're going to try and try and we're going to hurt each other, but we got to get it before we go back home, you know? And that, that was that was something. I miss those days. Yeah, that's serious. Were you guys, like, ever get to a point of, like, filming demo videos or anything like that, or was that not a it, thing yet? It was different times, man. I mean, yeah, there was, like, there was a scene for sure, man. I mean, uh, there was, this is before even the first Tony Hawk video game. Uh, this is This is, like, Sega Genesis days, you know? There was trans squirrel skateboarding, skateboarder. There was the, you know, the Bones and Power Peralta. We heard about them. There wasn't a lot of skateboarding uh, in Montreal. Uh, so, I mean, uh, we and no one had videos and the, no one had phones. So, we never really filmed. I never, I don't have a lot of those uh, video memories now. 
Did you ever like compete or anything, or was it just like hobbies? No, I never got to a. There wasn't a lot of competition in Montreal. Also, that was another thing. Uh, but I never competed. And at one point, I, I switched a little more to snowboarding because I, I would fucking be the guy. Lucky, it's kind of like uh, uh, it's ironic. I was actually the unlucky guy, and uh, I, I just bail a lot and hurt myself. So at one point, it kind of my mind was like, oh well, snow is a little softer, you know. So I put at one. I was a little better snowboarding. At one point, I had, I, I did not compete, but I, I was driven. Like I was almost there, and I, it was so much competing. Like at one point in my life, like say 16 to 18, uh, it was like, or even 1920. If I can get a couple of sponsors, kind of thing, just a couple, I can travel, like be a traveling fucking hobo, and just do some photo shoots. That 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 was a possibility at one point, you know. But uh, I got a big fucking bail at one point uh, doing a front flip. And basically, my, I did a front flip. I fell on my, I put my, my shoulder down because I was going to fall on my head. And uh, my skateboard, so my skateboard opened up my, my forehead. I, I folded, and my, my, my knee folded in the other direction. And uh, I just got stitches, but I fucked up my knee a lot and my back, and uh, then I was blocked. Like a, that's the difference between a pro skateboarder or snowboarder and uh, someone that doesn't go pro. It's like when you have that big, big bail, is it going to block you mentally after, or you're going to be even harder, you know? So I, mm. I, I, I got a little blocked after that, which drove me back to music eventually also. Okay, so you're basically done high school, and... You have your injury at that point, and so how do you end up getting back into music? I uh, so at that point, I mean, skateboarding and snowboarding, and being in Montreal where there wasn't that much of a metal scene compared to these smaller towns in Quebec. Uh, eventually, like it became more and more hip hop, and uh, a little bit of punk also, but. Uh, one thing that marked me for me was like the transition of hip hop that became dark and for me like there, there was a clear bridge between metal and hip hop when we started here in like 90 91 when we started here in like public enemy uh onyx like cypress hill uh and fucking wu-tang and wu-tang was like for me changed everything but those bands in particular they were so dark and they were so like violent and they for me, my ear, my mind, my, my soul felt it like metal. And also, the way they would rap and the, the technical and their individuality as MCs, for me, was like a, the dopest fucking guitar player in the world was this guy. But it's not notes, it's words, and it's written with his mouth, and also it's like it's messages. And, the, and now, the, uh, it's not just uh, like metal where it's symbols and these gnarly sounds that are demonic or this or that there's like fucking like let's say public enemy there's like, there's messages there's like true activism there's like true there, some fun some words that can 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 you know like get a whole crowd rowdy or some and then eventually that yeah i mean that at one point it was just hip-hop I, I didn't want to listen to anything anymore so this is around i had been listening for years but i mean around by the age of 18, I mean, I didn't want to listen to anything else. At 92, I didn't want to listen to nothing else than hip-hop. There was so much stuff going on. It was like you I, had to know <laughs> which one, what, what was coming out. How was the sound going to change? So that's a big, that's where I wanted to go with that right next. So this is where, like, it's super interesting to just hear from it. So you're in Montreal in the early 90s getting into hip-hop. I don't even think I've talked to that many people that are in that era from that time that are cognizant of what's going on. So what's it like to, how do you get access to music at that time? Like, how do you discover your new hip hop? Well, it was really friends. I mean, friends of friends, we'd go to, we'd still kind of skateboard. So uh, just as a mean of transport in general, we're just fucking around. But uh, we'd go to a lot of parties, like house parties. And then it was, uh, at that point, there was still like, it, there was CDs, but the cassettes were still pretty much there. And a big thing, like in house parties, was like discover the rarest fucking thing and you if you'd come to a party and you'd have like the rarest thing 
and because this is like there's not really internet people would flip out man and you'd be like kind of the the star of the show and also you just like you make your that that passion you had for that new band and uh, you share it with people i remember let's say everyone liked cypress hill you know and then i remember going to a party and some guy came with a dubbed cassette let's just like uh yeah, a cassette that was taped on uh this band called the Mexicans, Mexicans with uh, Z at the end, which was another uh, Latino LA band. They weren't as good as Cypress Hill, but they kind of sounded like them, you know, and uh, no one knew them. I remember like three parties later, I heard that same cassette that was dubbed from a cassette that, that was dubbed over another cassette that like the sound quality would go down to every party, you know, because no one had the original. No one knew how to get the original. And then there was other shit. Like, there was a... I think it was on McGill College. There was a place called Fat Chin Music, I think. Uh, that was, like, a New York guy. or He would go to New York, and he would bring back, like, mixtapes and stuff like that. So there was a couple of those shops also. And uh, so it was really word-to-mouth parties. It was a couple of obscure shops. And, yeah, and that was just before the Internet. Then the Internet hit, and it was the whole other game. It kind of accelerated our knowledge and the sharing of the whole thing. And there was no downloads at that point, but at least we, we'd see, let's say, pictures of the dudes. I remember, like, let's say Wu-Tang comes out, nine guys, and they all have fucking masks, and there's a ski mask or whatever, a nylon. There's no uh, real big Internet thing going on. We didn't know who was wh who. I mean, it was the mythology. It was like... I remember I thought Ghostface Killer was actually the voice of ODB and this guy and that guy. So it was just like the conversation between us. Oh, no, that's uh, this guy or that's that guy. And then, oh, but he's the dopest. It, but we had no fucking clue. It was just so mysterious, you know? It was exciting. I didn't even think about that before. I mean, like, I've looked at the cover, and I'm pretty sure it's because Ghostface had a warrant, so they did the mask so that they could all be there or some shit or whatever, whatever. <clears throat> yeah. Well, that was one of the music videos. Anyway, I don't know what it was, but like the fact is, if you're just looking at these guys and you just even see their videos or you see all their content, there's not, unless you caught that one video where like four of them are identified, it is super fucking hard to actually piece together which dude is which dude. That's it. And just like, even like, just like listening, trying to map out the names of people without, I don't know if they had lyrics back then in the stuff. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. But without lyrics, you just get nine guys rapping across like a bunch of music and then you got to piece together who's who and map out the voices without the help of lyric sites. Oh, yeah. That's a whole different world. Yeah, and back then also we were like, like trip, right? Let's say, uh, and we'll get stuff always like a year later in Montreal. So let's say... Uh, I remember discovering Gravediggers just before Wu Tang, so this '94, and then by the end of '94, I discovered Wu Tang. But also, like, uh, I remember fucking uh, tripping on uh, Gravediggers, and there was like, it was the beginning of the internet, so not everyone had the internet. And to find like a site that, let's say, had lyrics, that, that was any site at that point. It was very basic internet. So uh, a, a big thing was like, listen to the CD, pause the the just go a couple bars, write down the music by hand, man, pause it, put it back down. Sometimes you're not sure about the word, you're just fucking it up, but you take like two hours to write down the lyrics as a fan and just to, to fucking get that song by heart, you know, and then go to the next party, that song goes on, and you know that fucking song by heart, dude, you're flowing, and everyone's like, oh shit, that's fucking insane, you know? So it was just like everything, you kind of had to work for it, even as a fan, you know? It was an adventure around it. Yo, that's like, that's like a whole different level. I mean, just think about the things you say. Shout out Joué avec le doux for the follow. Um, uh, but like, think about everything you just said. First of all, the party vibe. I want to figure out how to recreate this party vibe where we all trying to flex on we know more underground shit than you. Like, who can drop the coolest shit in the world? Like, that sounds like a flex that could be done today still. Because the opposite, <laughs> here's the beauty of today. There's just so much music that now nobody's heard everything. Even you could yeah. just do this in Montreal. You could yeah. play who's the best in Montreal and everybody shows up with their best Montreal cut. And you could probably every fucking three months have a completely fresh list every single time and nobody would have heard of anything. That's actually a sick idea. I'm going to remember that one. For sure. But yeah. So like that vibe sounds amazing. Like popular music in clubs is a vibe. 
but on like rare cuts like, and you're not the first person to say it i was talking to deuce god and he was like yo that's my favorite shit i'm like wait there's just people who love this there's like this this culture of like people who dig around and find the most obscure shit and i mean i know it exists but just to think about it at a party is amazing but then you gotta like figure out who's who's write down the lyrics by hand memorize these motherfuckers some shit that might have taken me 30 40 minutes you're taking hours for because I, I mean by the time i'm in high school it's the 2000 2005 era so like yeah lyric sites exist we could just print it out and fucking run it um but like that's a lot of cool shit like that's like an era where i almost it almost feels like you're forced to care more and it almost explains a bit why maybe people care a lot more about lyrics right you're gonna have to listen to that motherfucker for two and a half hours straight just to get those lyrics down you're gonna have to really fucking like those lyrics like that's really, it. It, it can't that's be it. some vapid shit <laughs> that's it that's it. that's just that, that those days i was just a fan i wasn't writing my own stuff yet we're talking about 95 97 i started writing my own stuff in 98 so yeah so that just just as a fan man i was like whoa and at the same time without knowing i was studying lyricism and i was studying flows man and uh, just as a super fan you know and everyone it, knowledge was so important in those days well at least for me and a lot of people i know i mean you'd get the you'd buy it wasn't like today a download and stuff you you'd buy the cd and, and right away you check like uh, who's the producer of every track and where did they record and this and that you know so it, it was there there was really a we we cared about knowledge we really want when we talked about hip-hop we wanted to know really what was going on. We wanted to share that knowledge with people. You know, oh, no, this guy, oh, yeah, Gangstar, oh, yeah, Gangstar, he, that's DJ Premier. Oh, yeah, he's a producer. He's a DJ also. And uh, he produced this new track, you know, by, uh, let's say, fucking Jeru the Damager. Oh, who's Jeru the Damager? Well, fucking, you should check that album out. So there was always a link between an artist and another because of the producers, of course. Yeah, that's super cool. I wonder why people stop going that direction with producers. Producers are fascinating. Like, they're the, like, glue of a lot of shit, in my opinion. So, like, I'm super... Like, even behind the scenes here, producers work with everybody. Whereas rappers don't work with everybody. And so just producers inherently become more interesting on that front. Plus, they can usually engineer, which makes them way more fun to know than, you know... I'm not, yeah. It's not my favorite sure. thing in the world. Um, so what, what makes you get to that point, then, from geeking out on stats which i really like uh to actually going wait i can do this well that's it at that point i mean i wasn't i'm getting so i'm beginning in my 20s so we're so yeah like, like i said 98 right so uh i'm not playing guitar anymore really uh kind of skating anymore but uh, i'm i i'm kind of skating but not putting like any effort to do tricks anymore kind of snowboarding so i kind of I, I need another outlet kind of thing and i'm not a poser i'm not just going to be a, a fan i i've i've always tried to push myself whatever i was my main interest was so then i just start dabbling a little bit i had dabbled a little bit with really easy punk songs playing guitar because i wasn't the best fucking guitar player so i do power chords and write some stupid shit but then uh what really happened is there was a a family thing that I can't get in too much in detail with, but I, I was kind of uh, not talking to someone in my family and uh, living a lot of uh, emotional stuff. And uh, I had never written, let's say, a diary or stuff like that. And uh, so I'm just bubbling up. And as a young child and all that, I would get aggressive. So not hurting people, I would hurt myself. Let's say I'd go in and get in a fight with someone. Uh, it was mostly screaming, and I would, like, hit walls until I hurt my hand, you know, I would never hurt other people. And uh, so I had a lot of kind of stuff going on emotionally uh, as a young, uh, teenager and a young adult. And uh, after that year that I wasn't talking about to that family member, uh, Christmas time came out, this uh, came to, and this was, uh, so Christmas uh, 98. And uh, I was confronted to the person, I didn't want to see that person. So while my whole family is uh, celebrating Christmas, I go to the basement of my grandma's and I re write a song in French because uh, I was with this Francophone family and uh, I had to express it that way. And, but it was the title was in English. It was uh, My Life. And it was like uh, 
you know, like something stupid, like something like, moi young, uh, low eye, fuck everyone. I don't know, you know, it was that whole Anglo-Franco shit was going on in those years. It's 98. Uh, Yo, hold on, what does that mean? Cause it was 98. like, I'm young, low, high, fuck everyone. Uh, it was like, I, I was very confused, you know. Uh, I was, uh, but I wrote, but this title is, is whack, but the... I wrote, I, I wrote it naturally. It, it was like a trance, okay? I was in the basement. I was sober. I was very much sad and in my emotions, and I, I just started writing all this shit that was bubbling up, and time passed, and I was just in this zone. And, of course, being such a fan of hip-hop, it came out in prose and in poetry in that style. And the, I wrote, like, three 16 bars or something and a hook, a whole song. And uh, when I finished, I, man, I think I shed a tear, a tear, man. I was like, wow, you know? And then I could go and see my family and finish that. But I didn't explode that night, and I didn't hit my uh, break a wall, and I didn't hurt, hurt myself. I, I took that energy, and I, I put it into, into poetry, really. And hip-hop, for me, was the ultimate form of poetry. And uh, that was like a revelation. And then that whole year of 98, every time... I had whatever feeling that was deep because I'm a very emotional person. I would write write down poetry, hip hop, and by '99 I had a couple of songs, and then I hooked. I had a, a friend that was a DJ that did a lot of scratch, so I did a first session in the '99, just before Christmas, uh, on a Nas beat, affirmative affirmative action, and uh, did one of my first songs. That was like the first time I recorded on a four track tape deck, you know. And my neighbors were jazz musicians. This is 99. They were, there was a drummer and uh, the keyboard player, and they, they knew a really good bass player. They were jazz musicians uh, at the Université uh, de Montréal, a little younger than me. And uh, they were, like, uh, always jamming in their apartment. I didn't know nothing about jazz. So I was always like, hey, I'm a rapper, you know, let's jam. And they were like, uh-huh, yeah, sure, you know. <laughs> so, one, so so one day, so like I'm, they're like jazz snobs, and I'm just trying to be cool. And then uh, one day, I'm trying to impress this girl I go out with for a well, while. I'm frequent, I'm kind of seeing. And I have this little fucking tape with one of my songs on the beat from Nas. And I don't have a tape deck. So I knocked in my, my neighbor's house, and they're jamming their jazz at that point. And I'm like, and they're like sweating, you know, and yeah, what do you want? Oh, I don't have a tape deck. Can I use your sound? System? Yeah, no problem. And they go back into their jam space and I put it super loud to impress this girl, right? It's not that good. It's the first thing I did, right? And, uh, but it's honest. I've always been honest. And she's kind of being sweet with it. She's like, yeah, it's good. Don't give up, you know? <laughs> and then the fucking drummer comes out and he's like, dude, is that you? I'm like, yeah, I told you, I'm a rapper. Like, we should jam. Like, fuck yeah, we should jam. That became, so, within a month, dude, so that became my first band, Sculpture du Son, which started in December 99 and finished in 2004. That was four years. That was my development years under the local scene of Montreal. We did all the contests and the, a lot of stuff happened right. with that band. We got to talk about this era a bit, too, because a huge thing for me is uh well really what started all of this for me was i talked to preach on cobia and he described montreal hip-hop from like 96 to 99 just the english sheen and just kind of the cotonage ndg area almost and it took him two hours just to cover <laughs> three years now preach is special like that he has a talent yeah. for it but it made me realize how little I knew. Like I come into this scene in 2012, and at this point the scene is evolving into what it, it, it becomes, right? But this whole new era, these new people, and none of these new people know anything about this old shit. I can promise you, like people are unaware across the board of how much Montreal history has like taken place. Like I learned that D-Shade and them fucking open for Backstreet Boys. I learned, like, so much interesting shit, like, took place in this time frame. Yeah. But nobody really was there. <laughs> but you were there. So that's, yeah. like, wow. So you're, like, one of the earliest Montreal... Well, not early. I don't... I wouldn't go with earliest. But from this era of the, like, let's say late 90s, early 2000s, when the scene really does start to take yeah. shape, you're, like, one of these pioneer artists that are coming through. 
No, well, I'm I'm kind of following, like you say, like uh, like Shade of Culture. Shade of Culture was was the band in the, the Anglophone community. You know, there was some alternative stuff going on that had more mass appeal, like Brand Van Free Thousand also. But in the real hip hop scene, Shade of Culture. Every time there was like a a a good American band, whatever it was, it was Shade of Culture opening up for them. You know, I remember one of the best shows I ever saw was uh, KRS-One at the Spectrum in Montreal. The Rascals from Vancouver were opening up and Shade of Cultures. And that was a sick show. It finished with a big cypher, a, a big freestyle of all those bands, you know? So I was a fan also of the, the scene. And then when I started with these jazz kids, because one thing about me, coming from guitar and all that, I wanted to play live music. From the get-go, I did not want to play with a DJ. That was one thing about me. I wanted to be in a band. So whatever we were going to, I'm a rapper, we're going to do hip hop, but I have to find good musicians. So why not jazz, you know? And I, I want to be in a band. That was my whole thing. So, uh, so, and, and what happened also, there was, yes, this, Fran this English uh, scene, but most of my surrounding, my friends were Francophone. And then when I started looking at like the contests and the, the government grants and all that stuff, 2000, early 2000, this is before like, uh, the explosion also of uh, fucking like uh, handheld devices, uh, the smartphones, uh, the uh, the MP3 scene, and all that. It was still very much like demos, CDs, these contests, and all that. But most of the the stuff you could participate in was for the francophone scene. There was much more possibilities for francophones. So for me, I made a, a conscious choice, even though I was way more into English uh, stuff, and I. I think I could write better in English. I, I decided to do like francophone hip hop because I wanted to do all these contests and all that. So I did for 2000 to 2003 almost, it was only frank francophone. Then that band became like bilingual. And by the end of the band, the last year it was like only anglophone because we had a lot of failed deals. We, we won contests, but we had some failed deals. And, you know, we. There's a lot of stuff that didn't happen for us. So at the end, we were doing a lot of improv, and I, w I had a lot of pro like sound processors with my voice. We were doing some, like, sometimes our shows would be free sets of 45 minutes with all this improv. And within that, I'm may maybe rapping 25 minutes. And at that point, I'm just doing angle for me, you know? So there was a whole kind of, those four years, there was a whole journey of exploration. And, uh, and I, I kind of, I, I made choices to, to int integrate myself to a scene, and then I was kind of like, no, I'm, I want to do what I want to do. And then the musicians, they, they, they opened my, my, my mind to jazz. I discovered jazz, and we did a lot of improv, man, so that was fun. I wasn't like the best freestyler. For me, improv was the jazz improv, so it was kind of to improvise on music that is spontaneous. You know, so I would kind of do medleys of my stuff and do little parts that were improvised vocally. And then I'd have machines, man. I'd just do some crazy shit with my voc my vocals, you know? Like the loop fun. machine kind of stuff? Yeah, and just like sound processors and loop machines, yeah. I had right, a sequencer so also, <laughs> just I, I would use noise. So what's it like performing in a smoking aloud Montreal and all that vibe? Like, what's it like in that scene? Because, like... Everything changed in 05 when they banned smoking. Like, the entire fucking party yeah. like, well, the drastically first, shifted. So, my first demo was good. So, the song was, like, March 2000. Four songs, a demo. Uh, we went to a real studio and all that. And our, our launch was at L'Air du Temps. This is one of the last... Well, there's still a little bit. But this was a really legendary, small, small jazz venue in old Montreal. Uh, there's a movie with uh, De Niro called The, the Score, I think. Uh, he, he, there's parts that are filmed in that bar, right? This bar was very small and very smoky, and it was just a jazz bar. But because we were, I was with all these jazz musicians, we played there, and it closed like a year after. So our launch was with all these jazz legends that I did not know at all, a lot of old men. And they were impressed by my bass player, especially. Uh, Francois Surgeon, but uh, and I was just this naive kid, and I was doing like hardcore, kind of uh, borderline activism, kind of violent francophone hip hop, you know, mixed with jazz fusion. It was just weird shit, and yeah, a lot of smoke, man, and a lot of like small venues with like small roofs on, and you're touching the fucking roof, and 
and I'm asthmatic, and sometimes it gets so smoky, dude, I, I'd almost fucking be choking on scene, man, but it was fun, because it, it was organic, man, and, and people were very open-minded, man, like, it was a lot of stuff going on, as far as, like, live hip-hop, I know some people did it before me, there was Dice B that did it before me, a couple of years, and then there was Local Locas that Dice B, but these guys never recorded. It was like they did it live, or they had an album with beats, and then when they came live, they did it with live musicians. Me, I recorded with a band. I was in a band. So my contribution, as far as those years, was one of the first people to do it with live, organic jazz musicians that was actually doing everything live. There was never beats, never sequences in what we did. So that's what I did. That, that, and, and it was just how it happened. It's the people that, that I, I met and how it evolved. It was fucking awesome. I had a time in my life, man. That's serious. Were you, just out of curiosity, were you getting paid to perform? I mean, though, we did a lot of bars in those days. Uh, we'd get paid, like, not a lot. Get a, I mean, we were four musicians. If we'd get 200 bucks by the end of the night, that'd be kind of really good, you know? Often it was just like free drinks, uh, but a lot of free drinks often. You go back to the same places, so you can kind of almost have an open bar and a lot of friends, you know, and then uh, maybe you'll get whatever, 150, 175. We do like normally two sets, like two 50-minute sets or something. We were So I was like a, uh, a little alternative rap artist because – that's it. There wasn't a lot of people doing this live organic jazz stuff. For me, like the Roots was a huge, huge, huge influence, you know. Mm. So, uh, so I was kind of weird like that. I mean, I still had a lot of friends that were. I was starting to to make more and more friends that were jazz musicians, and uh, then I had some a lot of friends that were like street punks and kind of metal guys, and I had a little bit of rapper friends and shit, but almost nothing. So I was kind of a black sheep in the scene, I'd say, in those years, especially. Yeah. That's fair. Um, so you're going through all of that with the band, and then the band kind of evolves into you migrating into English. Why did you migrate into English? Well, that's it. At one point, like, uh, you know, we had fa failed deals, man, uh, record deals, uh, people bullshitting, people going bank bankrupt. We signed with... MP3, there was the MP3 wars, so uh, iTunes wasn't a thing yet. I remember signing with a Montreal uh, MP3 company and a Toronto MP3 company. Both went bankrupt. And uh, so uh, Hold up. we What's had an like, MP3 uh, company. It was like, you know, there was like iTunes that won like 2004, I guess, or five or something, became like, like the reference of like MP3, of selling music, you know, online. But before that, it was all these ind independents, like this company from Toronto, this company from fucking New York. This so t there was kind of a, a so war of like go who's going to be who's going to be relative, who's going to bring traffic and actually sell digital music, you know. And uh, that war finished with iTunes, you know. So uh, we lost a lot of energy and time, kind of kind of transitioning into the digital era era because we were lost we didn't know what we were doing at that point it was, there was a lot of stuff going on but so from those exceptions we were as artists that had a lot to express and that had tried somewhat to for to fit in formats and at least to be distributed and stuff uh we just kind of said fuck it we're going to do what we really like so it could be like a show, like I said, three sets of 45 minutes, which is almost all improv. At one point, we were not playing. We had free demos. We had like 15, 16 songs or something uh, and other stuff. But uh, uh, at one point, we did not play any of our songs anymore. It, we, it was like a big fuck you to the, the whole scene and the experience. So our friends would come. And they were like, play this song, it's awesome. And we we're like, no, we don't play our music anymore. And then it would just start, the show would start like with a, a, a fretless uh, five-string uh, bass solo of 20 minutes. And then we would get on stage, and then we would do this thing and that thing, and it'd make noise. And maybe in the third set, I would rap. So it was really a big fuck you. That was what it was. And so y'all were uh, making avant-garde shit 
to protest the industry but still getting booked? Yeah, because it was all these bars, so they didn't really care as long as we brought a little bit of people and people drank, so. That's incredible. <laughs> That's an incredible run. Like, I don't even know if people could get away with that today. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it was different. It was different days, man. That's were, you, sure. were you going by Lucky Lex back then? Yeah. How so did Lucky you Lex? choose Lucky Lex? It was, that, again, that uh, kind of uh, irony. So, uh as a young teen, a young adult, young teenager, I was the unlucky guy. So a lot of uh, the skateboarding stuff, bailing a lot, but also just weird shit. So I'm a peaceful guy. I'm walking on the street, something, talking with a friend, kind of like cross this person. He punches me in the face. I didn't even look at the guy, you know. So all these, all, a lot of weird fucking shit would happen to me, and so much that it became a gag. At one point, I get, I go to parties. And uh, people come up to me and, hey, Alex, hey, Alex, uh, what happened to you? Because they knew some shit happened to me, you know? And it was like the running guy, the unlucky guy. So, so that was that. And after like 99, so after a year of writing stuff, and I'm practicing on all these instrumentals I can find uh, on like CD, uh, I'm kind of figuring out like, I need a name, kind of need an artist name. And I, that week I had lost like my job, my girlfriend, a lot of shit. It was, I was kind of like, it was a bad week. And uh, the uh, answering machines were like a, a, a home phone. Uh, you could do like uh, the pre-recorded message where it'd be like, hey, you have uh, reached a vo voice box of, yes. and spontaneously <laughs> I blur out in this wag voice, kind of like, lucky Lux, just that. And then I, re I fucking hang up. Then fucking two days, it's like new job, new girlfriend, do this, new that. So I, I stick with it. It was like, like a stupid joke kind of thing. It was like I'm not lucky, and then Lex was from Alex. So I stick with it. <laughs> I think that is truthfully one of the best ways somebody has told me they picked their name. So I did it as a <laughs> gag on a voicemail, and it literally changed my luck and solved my problems. <laughs> I'm going to run it. All right, so... Let's say we go back to 2004 then. Uh, what happens after your band? So 2004, so that's it. After the fuck you period, it kind of falls apart because we're all in our fuck you uh, as a collective, but also as individual artists, we're all going different directions. So uh, so this guy wants to do a rock, uh, the drummer, let's say. The other guy wants to go back to jazz, the other guys. And uh, so I get a little bit left behind. Uh, but we we just naturally break up. There's no discussion about it. And then uh, I was so impressed, and I was so like uh, I had learned so much from these talented musicians that at that point I'm trying to qu I'm questioning myself like, am I even a musician? Like musician, you know, not a rapper or a poet, but a musician. So I had the sequencer machine that I had been fucking around. So uh, I, I said, fuck, I'm gonna try to do my own beats and do my own demo just to see if I'm a musician, if I can pull it off. So I did a six song demo that I went to my keyboard. My keyboardist had from that band had a home studio and he was actually a professor in sound recording. It's really good. And, uh, I did, so I did the whole fucking thing on a 16 track sequencer, a Yamaha RM one X and, uh, from a machine from like 2000 or something. And uh, I did all these loops and uh, very simple. So I would take like eight tracks for my drums and then eight tracks for melody. And then the way I would do it is kind of like, uh, let's say there's an intro, it goes to, uh, to the verse, to, to uh, the chorus. I would just mute certain elements to transition and progress. So that's the way I figured it out. And then I had this whole little dot. Uh, I would just do little dots on a paper and I had this language to make myself know how I composed it because I didn't know how to write music. So it was like this big process of fucking trying to compose my own music. But I pulled it off and I went to his studio and he helped me. He put a little bit of a, a keyboard on some tracks and a little bit of guitar on some tracks. And then one track, I, uh, I, I put samples, voice samples. And I took a v VHS cassette and I went to my girlfriend's house that had cable television because I didn't have it. And I recorded all these little bits of commercial and all commercials and all stupid things 
bits of two seconds and stuff. And I, that's the way I, I figured out how to sample. So we had to make, take this whole, these make puzzle pieces of all these little bits on VHS and make, tell stories with our, our samples. So anyway, after like a three month period of doing that, I have a So you're saying song. like the way that motherfuckers go to YouTube right now and grab a one, two thing, YouTube to MP3, load it into the DA. You, because I've never heard this one before, so I get excited when I hear people telling me new creative shit like that. Um, you would load up the TV, watch TV, and wait for the good shit, hit record, and hope it was the good shit. Well, yeah, I, I would, like, do a, a whole night of, like, bullshit cable television. There's a lot of infomercials, so they had a lot of, like, crazy voices and stupid fucking verbal bits and i uh, my rule was don't ever record more than three seconds or it's going to get too complicated so yeah and then i had like 45 minutes of three second samples <laughs> that was just for one song <laughs> so anyway my my uh, my my friend that recorded that was like the producer uh yeah he he worked a lot on it <laughs> he helped me uh, how, did I was get, so... how do you get the audio off of the vhs he figured it out he 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 <laughs> Put the VHS through uh, some kind of sound card in his computer, and he figured it out. Then he took it all. Then we isolated the sounds we wanted, and then those became puzzle pieces. And then we put the puzzle together to tell stories, because that that song was my last French song I did at that point. Everything else was English, and I had called it "Mass Perturbation," which is a wordplay with masturbation. So mass. Uh, uh, trauma tra traumatism ma from the mass uh, mass perturbation uh, it's a wordplay with masturbation and it was a, a, a song about uh, the negative effect of television <laughs> so it worked out very well conceptually but it was a mess and I was so naive but uh, yeah after, so we did that song we did six That's songs like super all. MF do me <clears throat> this is yeah this is 2004 this yeah and uh, yeah, I did that demo. So I did that demo with six songs, and then the, the cover was one of my friends that did some some collage, like uh, hand drawn stuff, very naive. And then I pressed 50 copies, just like uh, just like burnt some DVDs. I did some stickers, and I, I photocopied the, the the cover, and I gave it to like whatever, say QT, and a couple of people on the scene. But I mostly gave it to my friends. It wasn't for me about oh i'm gonna put put this out it was really about am i a musician can i carry on do it can I, do i have the credibility kind of it was to convince myself so that was the first thing i did after my first band yeah so you self-produced the project with some help just to and prove to people you could prove just myself. to valid yeah well prove to yourself you could and then you just made a limited run and gave it to some people and that was it that's it. That came out in 2005, I guess. Yeah. Does it still exist? I could find a copy. I think there's like Reverb Nation has three of the songs on it. <laughs> hey, Reverb Nation. <laughs> That's a treasure trove, honestly. I bet everybody's old shit's really buried there. You know what? I should start looking up people's fucking Reverb Nations for this shit. Let's see what the Word fuck up. I find. Word up. <laughs> That's a great one. Um, wow, that's, that's incredible. Do you like perform it or anything, or do you just put it out and move on? I did a couple of performances, which were really fucking hard to pull off because, like I said, I kind of like would mute elements. So I had sixteen tracks, and then let's say the the intro comes off, so it comes on. So hi hat. So it's like activate track one, hi hat, and then bass drum track free let's say and the, so i had to i had these these little codes on a piece of paper next to the machine and it was dark and then i kind of had like activate 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 so that's the intro and then uh beat hits i have to press five buttons at the same time and then i have to kind of start singing the chorus and then let's say after chorus okay to uh the verse so i have to mute seven tracks with my fingers and then i go into the, it was very hard because it was so fucking like a weird way to make music, but I did like uh, maybe four shows, very artsy, like a art exhibit, some community thing, 
and two bars probably. Nothing, never with hip hop artists. It was always with another kind of crowd. It, it just kind of people asked me to do it, and I guess I guess I did it. Are you saying that you literally took up like the fucking sixteen track machine, hit play on that from the start, just preloaded with your shit ready to go, and then would live mix the song while rapping? Yeah, that's it. I had to mute and and progressively, po- yeah, live. It was super hard. That's serious. <laughs> like when you really, really, really think about it, I feel so I mean, spoiled in this era. <laughs> I could have t- told the guy that recorded me to give me instrumental versions and just press play on a CD and just do it. But no, I was like, I couldn't move a lot because I had to stand still next to my machine and I had to do all this with this little coded language of paper next to me and then remember the lyrics and, and be on time. So I don't know why I made it so complicated, but yeah, it was pretty artsy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I would recommend that strategy, but it's so impressive no. still. No way. <laughs> don't recommend it. <laughs> so what comes after this uh, art project experiment? <clears throat> Yeah, so after that, uh, I was working this bar. I was kind of still in the jazz scene a lot. They had jazz shows, and uh, I started to be friends with some really big names, older people. Uh, and my guitar player, well, he wasn't my guitar player. He was a friend that just like, uh, he was a heavy metal metal guitar player, but uh, he worked with me in the kitchens in this place where there was some live uh, jazz. And he was a fan of what I did, and I, I liked him a lot. And he was, we went to see James Brown, yeah. So this is like, we went to see J- James Brown live in Metropolis. This is probably 2006, and uh, great experience. We come out of the James Brown show, and my buddy looks at me, the guitar player, and says, uh, Lucky, we have to start a funk band. I'm like, okay, why not? And then he talked to all these big names. So it was a uh, Alex Belgarde, which is a amazing upright bass player. There was Namori Cizé, that is a uh, he was a, a he's a Congolese drummer that played with Jean Leloup in his big band project. Uh, and then just other people. Uh, we had uh, Giovanni Ortega, which is a Cuban saxophone player. And uh, we started practicing. First, we started practicing two times a week, me and the guitar player, and we composed all the songs, so about 12, 14 songs. It was, it, he composed all the music, and we arranged together, and I would write to the music. And it was very, very much uh, symbiotic, both of us. And then after that three-month period or four-month period, we started, because they were very busy people and a little older, and they had some had families, uh, to integrate uh, on their time for no money. Uh, these jazz musicians, and then it became just like, like another level, and that became uh, Lucky Lex and the Adventure. And we went to uh, Studio Victor. Studio Victor uh, was the first studio in Montreal after the Second World War, the major first studio in Montreal to have been built by a major record company, Victor RCA, after the for, uh, Second World War. And it was one of, now it's, it's not there anymore, but Studio Victor was one of the most amazing studios in Montreal. And it had this half cylinder roof, this uh, wooden half cylinder technology from the end of the 40s and the, the uh, very high roofs. And the, the sound quality of this studio was fucking amazing. And we had like the like horn sections and some sometimes just one horn, full band, big drums, a, very, a lot of pieces and uh, upright bass these crazy funk arrangements and it was stri- it was all in english it was straight up funk with like very energetic uh, hip hop and it was a little bit of soul influences and we had a uh, coco thompson that uh, did some uh, female vocals on it she was a amazing soul singer uh it was a fucking great that that music was pretty fucking awesome and i played a lot with that band so it came out and it was some struggle you know uh, financing the project and all that and uh, but finally came out in uh, 2007 so we, we did that from probably about 2007 to 2010 or something and we play a lot of bars we play a lot of shows like we do like at least well in the summertime and all that it was like two shows a week we came we became a house band for some places and 
the the players I was playing with were so like kind of busy and all that and living from their music. We all had jobs so that I I couldn't keep up with all the because sometimes we were like eight on stage or nine. So I was switching players a lot. There was made in those three years I maybe had twenty five players on that in that band, you know. I made it happen. I was it was fucking awesome. It was great. So you coordinated an ongoing open band of jazz music or funk sorry, funk musicians yeah. that were like people who were names and then you rapped and you guys first put together this project and then you kept it alive like you're basically one of them old timey big band dudes but in Montreal in like two thousand seven or eight. Yeah. Two thousand seven to two thousand ten. And I went mm-hmm. to get a sponsorship from a Lucky Seven T shirts. So we all had that gear on stage and we a little bit so like uh, a little influenced by uh, George Slinton and stuff. So we drive, we dress very colorful and very loud and stuff. It, it was very uh, much a, an homage to uh, James Brown and George Slinton and uh, our love for like jazz, soul and funk, especially. And that energy, that funk energy. So, uh, yeah, that was great. That was really fun. Uh, we played a lot live. We had a lot of fun. That was great. Yeah, so I have sorry, one album. Yeah. Is that out there still for the world? I still have some uh, boxes of CDs I didn't sell. I think I have a hundred left. Uh that's on the uh, Reverb Nation. <laughs> it's amazing though. Yo, but we're learning that Reverb Nation is actually a treasure trove because you gotta just imagine, yo, I've never thought to look there, but how many people from like an older era just put up reverb nation and we all just forgot it's not like yeah, any of us went yeah. back and deleted shit we just stopped using it yeah and myspace too <laughs> that one's unfortunately just gone like, I don't, can you still use my no i think a lot of the myspace shit is gone i i actually get emails once in a while like every two months you have a new follower that's incredible Okay, maybe my space is worth rating too. We'll check it out. We'll we'll dig in deeper into like yeah. the past like that. Yeah. But um, did you get to go like like anywhere like on tour outside of Montreal, or was it more like you just established yourself within the city? I well, like, with that kind of project, just holding it together with eight nine people, with their all separate lives and busyness. I I never I was I'm still to this day. I mean, I'm very much a local artist. Well, now the internet so other stuff is happening now with spotify but i never really toured uh, outside of quebec really i never toured outside quebec. i did some shows like in quebec city and some small towns around montreal and shit but i'm a yeah i'm a local artist man. yeah it's big it's big dope so what do you do after the lucky lex project and why, why does or the lucky lex and the ventures right and the and the adventure yeah and the adventure so what uh, what makes it stop in 2010? Well, just juggling all that stuff, you know, and uh by that time uh, uh also we had played so much bars that we kind of got got to a a max of what we could do, like no one was coming anymore cuz we played too much kind of thing. So uh, we still could book, but it was we didn't have a, as much as a crowd. And yeah, ju- can't kind of keeping that juggling the players. Uh, it gets gotten a little bit harder, so uh, it wasn't like final. It kind of just faded out, I guess. Yeah, faded out slowly. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point still about live, right? Because whatever about the internet marketing world is what it is. The live scene's opening up again, which means now's a good time to be wise about approach and. If you're saying there's a danger in oversaturating your live performance and its ability to pull people, that's like probably still true. <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, you know, even to this day, well, I'm not so concerned by live anymore because I'm older and also like COVID and shit. But, uh, uh, but even those days, like bookers was hard to find for me. And at that point, I had transitioned for a, a, a while into Anglophone, you know. And uh, I had trouble finding people to help me promote and uh, really hit that anglophone market and to book outside of Montreal. And that that would have, at that point, that band, that, I mean, we should have went to Ontario, New York, whatever, at least, you know. We could have done a Canadian tour. It was super, 
it was accessible. You know, it was funk. I didn't. There was no blasphemy or swearing in that project. It was like kind of like my pop funk in the sense that it was very clean. You know, uh, kids could listen to this music, so it had a lot of mar like it was marketable. But I, I I never found those people to help me like promote my music properly. So I guess that's why those kind of projects kind of did not go to their full potential. But I, w I was never bitter of that. I mean, for me, it's a journey and just like enjoying all these moments, creative moments. And, and the fact that since the beginning, all I'm telling you is bands. And I'm, I'm never that DJ just getting a beat or that, that MC just getting a beat or uh, being with one DJ. It's meeting all these people. By this time, uh, after this band, I've played with 35 different people in Montreal, you know? So it's meeting all these people and growing as a musician and an artist. So that's that's what's kept kept me like interested in, in doing music, you know. Uh, so after that, uh, that faded away uh, around 2010, 11, and uh, 2010 more. Uh, there was like a six month six month yeah. period. Uh, my 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 pops passed away, and that kind of and I remember he he came to see one of my last shows of that funk band, you know. And uh, he passed away suddenly of a heart attack. Uh, I wasn't that close to my pops, but it kind of fucked me up a little bit. And it was the first time I kind of stopped writing and doing music for more than a couple of months, let's say. Because between projects, it's like maybe a month or two. Uh, so now I stopped like eight months or something. And uh, what happened from then is that that same guitar player comes to see me and he says hey you know that bass player from my first band so dragon we call him dragon the guitar player that was my funk guitar player came to see me and then he told me hey you know your bass player Francois Surgeon, the jazz guy from Scutson, the first band he's doing some really cool shit and I like his energy and he's into this Buddhism and, and this like meditation and all that and his clean living. And I think we should go see him and we should do some like Buddhist fucking world music. And I'm kind of in a detox period of my life and into Buddhism at that point and trying to find some spiritual closure with the death of my father. So I'm like, oh, well, I just wrote this song. Uh, what is it called? Smoke. It was about like detoxing a weed or something. Uh, a very personal song, uh, very poetic. And we kind of composed it, just me and him, like we used to do. And we went to see Francois, the bass player. And he was fucking like in this minimal, minimal living, meditating a lot, clean of everything, eating fucking fruit and drinking tea. And we, we met, we, he introduced us to other bands, other players, and uh, that big drop of a dime. So drop of a dime was acoustic world hip-hop really so that was trippy it was everything was acoustic so acoustic guitar acoustic uh bass uh a cajon uh brazilian percussion percussion different small percussion a small like indonesian and indian uh, little bells and stuff and then we would play in a, a circle with tea and shit and we would do this spiritual music and then uh, we had a two amazing female vocalists in that band. It, fi it finished that we did, did a couple of shows. We played the Burlesque Festival at the Club Soda, which was fucking awesome. And uh, we did uh, a couple of other shows, and we did a four-song demo. That was fun. It was kind of a transitional thing. That was... How do you do so many? I guess I know how you do so many different things. Because when you were little, you went around the world and you traveled and you saw a lot of different things. So you're exposed to just new. <clears throat> yeah. But that's like, I... like if you think about your career trajectory sonically compared to most people's, you're like definitely not taking a standard path here. In fact, you're like really one of those guys that really allows people to explore creatively because you did and now it's become more normalized because folk were doing it and as you said it was complicated because it was hard to meet people throughout this process probably because you're out there doing completely different shit that i could imagine other people weren't doing 
Yeah. Well, I've always been very open-minded, you know. Uh, I have one person, uh, he was a keyboard player in that uh, funk car project. He was this Hungarian, uh, new uh, immigrant in Canada, a very talented keyboard player. And uh, I remember going to, like, uh, a bar with him, and I was alone and uh, with him. And by the end of the night, we're a little drunk. And he looks at me, and he has no experience in hip-hop or funk a little bit, of course, in, uh, in classical and jazz. Uh, he looks at me, and he kind of switches on me, man. And he, I'm chill, man. He doesn't even have friends and shit. And I'm with him in this bar alone, uh, spending my time and energy with him. And he switches on me, and he looks at me, and he says, You know, Lucky, I like you and shit, but for me, that's not it. And I said, and he's weird, you know? And I'm like, the fuck is this guy talking about? He's like, you know, it's not it. And he's kind of like weird in his English because it's not his first language. And I'm like, uh, what do you mean it's not it? I said, you know, your music, it's cool and stuff. I like, kind of like it, but for me, it's not it. I said, okay, what the fuck are you trying to tell me? And then he says, you know what your strength is in life? I said, what? And by this time, I'm not liking what he's saying. And I, I said, you, you have the power and energy to put people together from all walks of life that would have not even blinked at each other on the street, that they would never even talk to each other. And you have that power to put these people together and make them create stuff that they have no idea what it's going to become. And that's very special. And for me, I took it as a fucking insult because I felt like, you tell me you don't fucking like my music? Like, why the fuck are you in my band, dude? Like, why are you talking to me like this? So I'm like hurt, you know? You can go back home and shit, forget about it. But like a year or so after that, I thought about that. And I took it as a compliment, you know? Whatever, everyone has their, 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 their likes in life and all that. And maybe he didn't really like hip-hop. Maybe he didn't like my voice. But I took it as a qual uh, as really he gave me... Uh, he gave me some props, you know, and, and it's true what he said. I think, I think I do have that power of attraction of putting people from all walks of life in very different backgrounds and different souls to create this new thing. And I think that's what helped me as a, an artist evolve is to be open-minded and to always have this interest in authentic human beings that have their own thing going on So and learning from them and just having this melting pot of art, you know. So that's, yeah. That's what's kind of naturally been my 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 driving force, I guess. Yeah, I like that a lot. I like I like the way your story plays out because it's just again, it's so different. It's like it's as obscure as the music it sounds like you make. Just quick side note: shout out Davy Man four one eight for the follow. Appreciate that. Word up, see, Davy Man see. produced two songs on Step. Yo, big up. That's fucking great. That album is ridiculous. So since I liked all of the songs, I definitely like Davy Man's production. <laughs> um, and I don't say that hyperbolically. I really fuck with art that is just sonically in line with what music's supposed to be, in my opinion, which is a big topic, but like also does something kind of cool with it. Like just the way you deliver Imagine. Just everything about that song is pretty distinct. You got like a vocal range you're not expecting, especially coming off the last project. Like you look at the way it's all just put together, the, um, the the way you just create this whole thing. But it also just doubles down on the part where you don't give a fuck what I think, because what's more important is what you imagine. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that sounds like some real artist shit. Like fuck you, listen to my trends. They know better shit, and I liked it a lot. I liked it. I really did. But then it just progresses into just like every song is this unique experience that sounds unlike the other songs, either in topic or sound. And that is truly special in music. Not, not, I don't find many people can really do that. Like, I don't think I can do that kind of thing. That's like one of those things where I'm like, ah, nah, I'm pretty redundant. I know that. I'm fine with that. Not always, but like the, the way you come at it so different, it's like, fuck me, man. Like, that's tapping into shit. Like, I don't even know where you were coming up with it. But it's not just, like, the rapping part. It's the songwriting. How do you make a song about junk food just to satirize drugs? You know, like, that's so nifty to me. Like, like that's... Like, it sticks. Uh, 
I want to take a, a little moment uh, right now before I go on to something else. Uh, you talked about Imagine. Uh, uh, that producer is called Malcolm Ivrain. He produced uh, Imagine and he produced a uh, single on the step and is a great, talented person. And he's First Nations. I want to take a little moment to give my condolences and uh, peace and love and respect to First Nations. And my man Malcolm that did two songs on that album, Step. And Willie Scandal is also it's a good supporter and a friend that's been helping me a lot. Oh, Willie Scandal is my music, the homie. You know? So, yeah, I just wanted to take that little moment to you know, acknowledge that, too. Uh, yeah, I mean, music, uh, for me, yeah, it's like, at that point, like I said, so 2011, we're doing this fucking hippie shit, and it's super fun and trippy, and it's kind of very cleansing and cool. And then, uh, again, uh, we're all these different, very different minds and going in different directions. Basically, the album just takes forever, man. And I have a lot of stuff to express, and I have really at that point in my, my this is 2012, I've been 12 years doing my original music with four four free bands. Yeah, I had kind of dabbled in solo stuff. Uh, I, I kind of know what I want to express and what I want to do at that point. So I go to a studio in 2012 to the producer, uh, some guy I know through another friend uh, for years. And I did not know him. I knew the friends of ours. And uh, his name is Alex Blaine. And he had this uh, his first studio came out of uh, school. He was a bass player, a sick bass player. He, he All the Lucky Luck stuff, it's his bass. And aside from uh, Step, my last album, that has multiple producers, all my solo stuff is all produced and recorded and mixed uh, by Alex Blaine. So I go to this guy's studio, and he's this uh, amazing kind of alien, really creative, uh, energetic, crazy uh, producer. Where's and I have studio? a great... Huh? Where is his studio? Uh, there's no video. It's just, uh, it's just. Uh, no, I said, where is his studio? Like, oh, at that point, uh, Vidre. <clears throat> he was like in a, a uh, he was like in the basement of his apartment, like a half dirt basement. Bought a board and some some stuff, and he it's his first studio. And now he's like he has it's, he's uh, in his fourth studio. Now his studio is in uh, Oshlaga, and we share it with uh, he shares it with DJ Horg which is a pretty important DJ and producer of the francophone scene. He's, he's, the, he's the guy, you know, he has a very long career. So now it's a nice studio. But in those days, it was a shitty studio. But uh, this guy is fucking awesome. And I do like, uh, my first song was, was Luck You, Luck You on, uh, on the Keep on the Line. And uh, I do that song. And then I do My Solution. So uh, I'm expressing that stuff, and I had written those songs, and I, I could not put them into the band, the, the, the hippie stuff, and they work out. The hippie stuff's not going anywhere as far as the album's supposed to be out. So I kind of say to the guys, like, uh, sad, but like, I know where I want to go. I have stuff to do, and I want to be productive, and I want my music to be on all platforms and distributed, and I want to produce the most... I've ever produced in my life, you know. I'm in my 30s now at this point. It's 2012, and uh, I, I'm like, I have to be in control of my fucking music because I want my music to be heard. I cannot lose my time anymore compromising with people. Sorry, guys, you know. So I break up that band. And then, uh, since then, I've been solo. So then I've been working with Alex Blaine. So basically what happens is Alex... To this day, aside, let's say, the, the last project that I had other producer, but in general, Alex Blaine will compose a shitload of music, just beats. Sometimes he'll put live guitar, live this, live that, but it's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, a, a basic, uh, uh, just a, a platform for, for beats, uh, basic beats. And then he'll send me his ideas, and then I'll kind of pick and choose, and I'll start writing on the music, and then I'll go back and forth with him uh, to help arrange. Okay, this is cool. Let's put a horn section. Oh, let's put some Latin percussions on this. Oh, let's put some scratch from DJ Horde. And that's how I've been working. So now with my resources, my musicians that I, I, I've had in my past, and his, all his family that he brought, which uh, is the uh, Blex Experience is our collective. We, we, uh, we released some stuff on that name also, Blex Experience. Uh, 
So now I, I, that, that's my crew, you know, and that's, that's how I've been working. So I'm now a solo artist since 2012, and uh, I've never produced as much music that is actually accessible on all platforms that anyone could buy or stream for free and sometimes free downloads, you know. And that, that was important for me at that point. It was like, I, I want to be heard, man. It's not like I want to be popular. I want the stuff to be out, man, on those big platforms. I want people to be able to hear it and like to be in control, man. Okay, I'm writing a song, I'm writing an album, and in these six months, it's going to be out. So yeah, so for the last fucking, it's going to come up to ten years soon. So 2012, I started going solo, but still that with one producer that is my partner in crime but still a family of musicians. So that's the progression now. And this is Lucky Lex. This is solo. Yeah, so how did, but like, so when you got into that, like, first project, you just kind of, was there, like, concepts behind it or anything? Like, or was it just kind of an assortment of songs that you put together? And then when it comes out, how do you actually go about promoting it? Okay, so, uh, again, it's very often introspective, personal emotional spiritual stuff um very real to me i mean music for me is therapeutic uh, and conceptualizing uh when i started this whole project with uh, keep on the line i wanted to be a concept album so and for even further than that i wanted to do a trilogy i like like progressive rock bands and all types of shit in my life and i always admire like artists and bands that did trilogies even like cinema i was like how dope would it be to do like concept albums and do a trilogy so that was in the back of my mind and then keep on the line yeah it's played off like a a whole concept album so the the first song is called where i'm going which is confusion options and then uh, it would go to like uh say what uh can't keep on the line uh, it, there's three songs that are kind of representative of darkness depression all that and then it goes to like on a mission that's like the taking control of your life and and it progresses like that and it, it goes to the the last song um uh, i'm having blanking right now uh anyway the last song is a, is is about like just happiness so it's a, the, the first song was like confusion depression transitioning uh taking control of your life and happiness um, so that, that was the whole concept of keep on the line. Um, so yeah, it played out like that. It was, as far as my, my, my solo stuff, it was my darkest stuff because I was at that place also in my life. And uh, I very, very much with that project and that solo stuff needed to reaffirm my happiness and uh propulse it with uh, that album in particular as far as promotion i mean i just have i'm a i'm a i'm a independent artist i'm not on a label but i have a distribution everywhere and that's what was most important for me i did a little bit of shows with uh keep on the line i would just do kind of the simple rapper thing so it was like beats on cds or mp3 I would go to act, activism kind of stuff, uh, art galleries, whatever. It was, again, very artsy. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that was also in the years of fucking the uh, whole student manifestations and all that. So I participated in that, too. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, not big promo because I suck in promo. I never found the guy. But at least it's fucking available, you know? And then I did uh, two videos for that album, too. I did uh, Where I'm Going with uh, Jay Manifest. Jay Manifest does most of my videos as a director. And I, he's a rapper, too. I did some stuff with him. And uh, I did another video from Keep on the Line. So Keep on the Line was uh, my uncle, which a little bit was my dark muse of this project. Uh, like me going through some uh, depressive issues. My uncle, which I really admire, he was at this point in his uh, 50s, uh, was di diagnosed uh, bipolar and like totally fell off, you know, like he didn't do, he was, a, a, you know, uh, attemptive suicides, uh, he was committed in and out and very much depressed. And 
he had he's a francophone and he he always liked me a lot because i never judged him and i was always cool with him and he doesn't really know how to talk in english and all that but or to express himself what i say but one one day he 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 told me this thing keep on the line you know and it was kind of just weird the way he said it because he doesn't I guess he, it meant something to him, and I, I didn't really... For me, when he said that, I remember, like, operators on the phone, and they were like, okay, keep on the line, we're going to put you to the uh, next uh, transfer you. And I was like, well, what, what does he mean by keep on the line? And then I got it, there was kind of like, keep, stay balanced, you know, stay balanced and uh, and follow your own path kind of thing, you know? I, I, I understood that that's what he wanted to express to. But the way he phrased it, and keep on the line. I thought it was powerful, and it was kind of my motto inspired by him that he gave me as a gift. And uh, one of my last songs with actually with uh, Drop of a Dime was called Archetype, and that song was inspired by my uncle Andre too, and that was like a biblical song that was talking about his whole his fantasies that he's an archetype, an archangel, because a lot of time like bipolar is confuse reality with uh, their own beliefs and or, or catalysm or anything else and uh, so archetype became kind of like the transition to my solo thing and keep on the line you know and to see my my uncle kind of degrade mentally inspired me to push myself and to be happy and it became even more powerful to make this album and to make it not only for myself, but hopefully I could touch people and inspire them, you know, if they were going through similar issues. And uh, the last song on that album was actually called Beautiful, and it was super fucking happy and poppy and cheesy, but it had to be that way because that's the, the, that's the album. That was Keep on the Line. Yeah. That's a good one. <clears throat> um, so what else? So you're also doing the chef thing this whole time, right? Yeah. Yep. What's it like being a chef that's rapping in this? Like, what's it like doing this, at balancing all of this and the opportunities in that world going for you? Well, that's it. I've, uh, I've, since I, uh, that, that whole part of my life, so since I've been an adult, been pretty much in kitchens. And uh, by that point, uh, I was full on chef or sous chef in all my positions. And for me, uh, it was uh, my friend uh, Olivier that brought me uh, into this world. And I just started dishwasher and then started learning cooking. And what was cool about the cooking universe is that it's a, it's a scene of misfits and bandits and weirdos and artists, man. Like, uh, those kitchens are full of fucking freaks and, and awesome people. So... I could very much relate and very and, and have a lot of fun with my colleagues. And also, you can kind of make your own schedule. So it's easy for me to be a musician if I was a cook because I could always be free for any show. And I just kind of paid enough for me to just continue doing what I want to do and live on my own and this and that. And, uh, yeah, so cooking was, it was just about freedom and it was just about, again, your uh, you're in a community. When you're a cook, you're in a community. There's a language, and so that that was like super relatable and super important too. I mean, a lot of my fans and a lot of people that filled those smoky bars and venues were cooks, you know, and waiters and dishwashers and weirdos. And so that's that's been a great journey too. Yeah, for sure. It's probably like an interesting way to almost promote yourself to be in that kind of an environment. Because why I say that is I've been in an office, but at the same office for over a decade. Yeah. At a certain point, it's the same, like, 100 people with yeah. very little variations, right? So, like, you really have to get the fuck out of work. But if your work life can be such a almost revolving door of characters, it's a really powerful way to network. For sure. And, like, it's party, you know? It's party central. Often you finish the shift with a couple of beers and... A lot of people take drugs and shit. Like it's, it's a fun time, you know. Cooks are fucking fun. It can do. It could lead to dangerous places too. That that happens. I've seen some people fucking have problems in that scene too. But 
it's fun. Like, especially in your 20s, to be, like, working in kitchens and pubs and bars in your 20s and being an artist, whatever art you do, that's, like, that's the best 20s you can have. Being a musician and a cook, that's fucking awesome shit. Fair enough. Um, so, how do you end up getting linked into the Plas Bell situation? Yeah, so, uh, evolved from one job to another. Uh, then at one point it was just like, uh, I mean, since I've been a cook, now I'm not, uh, we can get to that later, but, uh, 25 years of cooking, you evolve. At one point you're a chef, chef and sous chef. You got a great resume, a wide array of experience, and, uh, I've never really looked for a job. I mean, this guy I used to work with is at this place now, so he calls me, or this, so you, you, you have so many friends, you know, that are, at that point, chefs, sous chefs, and all around the city, and even all the way to BC, you know. And uh, uh, so it was a friend. It was a friend at uh, Centre Belle, and uh, he put on his Facebook, "We're looking for cooks." So I go see him, pass an interview with the chef uh, of the Canadians of Montreal, and uh, he tells me, "Okay, so you have a great resume. What do you want in this and that?" I said, "Well." I want a good job, you know, I'm uh, getting older, musician, this and that, but I don't do so much show, I'm more a creator, you know, uh, so I want to make money, I want to have a good position. Uh, I say, tell you what, put me wherever the fuck you want, for three months I can do anything you want, any position, any fucking, I'll show you how hard I work. I said, I'm coming here and you're offering me six, seven dollars less than what I did in my last job for an entry level job. So you have to understand, this is not interesting to me. I'm going to do three months. I expect at the end of three months to have a big promotion in whatever positions are available. And if not, I'm going to leave because I have a seasonal job in B.C. near north of Vancouver. So that will be that. And then I did it. I worked all the angles and I, I, I applied to all the positions and I got the biggest opening they had which was the Platte Bell head chef to take care of feeding the Rockets of Laval, the school team of the Montreal Canadiens, and all the event co-shows at Place Bell. And that was a new venue, the Place Bell, uh, which is the third uh, biggest arena in Quebec after the Saint Bell and Video Hall in Quebec. And it was a huge thing. And uh, I was the first chef to, and to this day, because it was closed with COVID, uh, I was the only chef there. I've, I've, I've done that journey there. So it was huge. When I got the, the job, I was so, so happy. And uh, as prestigious as it is, it, the position is, they didn't have the best installations. You know, the salary was good, but uh, the installations were so-so, and it were a very minimal team. So we had to work really fucking hard in some weird spaces, you know, with not enough of equipment. But I made it happen. And uh, for me, like, when I've had sous chefs and chef positions it's really about creating like a family of my little crew and that they have fun we listen to hip-hop when we work we have a good time and we become friends and that's when you're whatever you work in you have to be happy and if you're a person that's a boss i think it's your job also to make your 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 employees happy and i mean to enter that arena man and to be in the uh the the whole facilities of these professional hockey players and then to see the the shows being set up and the artists feeding the artists meeting the artists to be there when they have there's no one in the arena to for the sound checks you know like it's been that was crazy man two and a half years man. so I you're like watching the sound checks do you get to like talk to the artists yeah i've talked to a couple of artists it's like uh, it's balancing it's again like they're human beings, so it's just like you have to feel it and you have to be professional and respectful. I mean, uh, let's say uh, Lauren Hill, you know? Lauren Hill, she's known for, like, her character is a little rough and this and that. And people say she's a diva. I don't care. I don't know her. I'm not going to judge her, but I'm going to feel her. So I see her sound check. First of all, I have fucking chills every time I'm passing next to the stage, going back and forth from one kitchen to another, preparing these meals. I'm listening to all these songs from Lauren Hill for that is for my generation like the best 
soul singer out there, you know, with Erica Badu. And I have chills, and I cannot believe it. Then she does a sound check. Usually it's like 45 minutes of sound check. She does like over two hours sound check, always stopping her musicians very, very, uh, like, by, like by her way or and very serious and driven. And like I'm like, okay, yeah, what I heard is, is, is real, you know. And then she leaves, and she comes to the cafeteria, and she has her entourage, like six people, all in a circle around her like a force field. And she talks only to her people, and she never looks like on the side. She looks straight, or she looks to the person in her entourage. So you can tell by the the, the, the body language, she does not want to be bothered, and she's very focused. So you know, you know, you're not even you're not going to talk to her. Then she goes to the cafeteria, which is next to my kitchen. And I, I'm the one that has their buffets, but they're like high end buffets. And then uh, I have to make sure everything's okay constantly, go back and forth. Only thing I say to Lauren Hill, she's sitting, she's talking with her people. I just say, uh, she, no one's talking at one point. I just say, oh, uh, Miss Lauren Hill, I just want to tell you, thank you, uh, welcome to Montreal, and thank you for all your beautiful music. It's really touched me. And she just says thank you, and that's it. And that's all I had to tell her. You have to be respectful of the person, not bother them. But then other experiences were fucking sick, you know, really sick. And uh, we can get to that, you know. For me, like the Wu Tang Clan was the sickest shit ever. Right tell us about the Wu Tang Clan experience, yo. Just so you know, I was in the crowd at that show. Yeah, we, we talked a little bit about that. So that's the uh, July, I think, twenty nineteen. Or whenever the fuck it was, um, I don't remember yeah. when it was. Yeah, I know exactly. it was there, and yeah. um, I was not having the same experience you had. I went in, I watched the DJ guy, I watched the Wu Tang, I went home. But tell us about your version of that night. So, like we we've known from the beginning, that they changed my life. They were a huge influence, you know. Uh, so I've seen the Wu Tang a lot. Also, I've I've seen them so many times at this point in fucking Vancouver solo member and group right uh, in Vancouver and Montreal every fucking time uh, in Toronto and in New York so I'm, I'm fucking super fan you know I, I bought all the books I have read every fucking article I fuck, I followed all these motherfuckers I love the Wu-Tang so this is a dream come true so I come into work uh, I go buy fucking because I don't have vinyl I just have CD collection and uh, my MP3s and shit. So I go buy the fucking uh, 36 chamber vinyl, of course, a nice uh, silver marker, and because uh, I'm geeking out for sure. So uh, I prepare. I'm with my little team, and everything's fucking beautiful. It's all set. It's clean. I know these guys. The, the, the history of these guys. I know that that RZA is vegan. I know uh, a little bit their lifestyles. You know. So we have, uh, for lunch, it's like a sandwich bar, you know, so a burger bar. So it's the uh, Beyond Meat just came out. So that's the craze for the vegans. So we got the whole vegan section, then we got the, the meat section. And then we got the salad bar, and then we got this and that. And uh, then it's all set, and I'm all waiting, and I have my vinyl on the other side and shit. And uh, I'm nervous as fuck, dude. Like, I'm, I'm shaking. I'm just waiting for that moment. I had met... RZA at like a signing. I never go to signings, but I went to for a Jazz Fest signing at one point. Uh, I took a picture with RZA and I signed like one of his uh, Digi Snacks CD there. And uh, other than that, I never geek out. I never go to signings and stuff. So I'm fucking nervous, dude. I'm shaking and stuff. And I'm with some people from Saint Bell that always come, like some uh, some the managers and stuff. And I'm telling them this is this is my best band in the world. If you tell me you can only listen to one band, it's Wu Tang, you know. I'm like, I can't fucking believe that I'm going to see all these guys here and I'm cooking for them. This is a dream. So then I'm preparing and all that. First person to come into the, the cafeteria is the RZA. I see the RZA and I freeze and I just say, the Abbott. And I'm just like a fucking kid. And I'm just like, the Abbott. And he's like, boom, boom, what's going on? Boom, boom, what's good? We're eating, we're eating, you know? And then I'm like, oh, we have a burger bar. I know you're vegan. We have some Beyond Burgers. Oh, yeah, I got Beyond Burgers. Oh, that's the shit. Nah, 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 nah. He's with you at YDB. So that's like, I'm like, 
that's the first tour where fucking YDB represents his fucking father, ODB, so that's touching as fuck. And his, he's with his uncle, Riza. I'm like, wow, this is fucking awesome. And then they start, they, they, go, they get their food and all that. I start talking to, be, to them a little bit, you know. I remember one moment where I shake the hand of uh, YDB and uh, said, uh, hey, man, I just want to tell you I'm a huge fan of your father, and uh, I want to tell you uh, how much I respect what you're doing right now to, ca to carry on his legacy and how proud he would be, you know. And, man, he was touched, you know. He's a human being. He was like, ah, oh, thank you, man. That means a lot, you know. And then it was like, uh, every time I go back and forth, I was like geeking out and blurring some shit out, you know. It was like, Riz was really cool. And it was cool because they were sitting together, I guess, an uncle and nephew. And they, they stayed like for almost five hours, those two, in the cafeteria. They could have been in the bus. They could have been in their private lodge. Uh, but no, they're, they're, they're cafeteria, man. Very normal. Talk about whatever. And uh, they're enjoying their meal. And every time I'm coming, every half an hour or something, geeking out i'm like dude uh, i've been listening to you since first six chamber i saw you guys maybe 20 times man this is that i said one point i say oh the, the geekiest fucking shit ever because i have a song on the i have a song called the uh, connect on the album sound barriers and that's with kinetic nine from killer army wu-tang so kinetic nine was the hype man of rizza when he for a long time when he did his solo stuff Kinetic Nine was his hype man. And on every RZA solo album, Kinetic Nine is featured on one song or the other. And he's from Kill Army. I hooked up with Kinetic Nine. When Twitter came out, I hooked up with him and we did a song by distance. And that was that. I ended up on fucking uh, a Wu-Tang blog spot and this and that and all types of Wu-Tang shit. I got some followers. I, I premiered on the uh, Next Level Ice T uh serious radio thing that was the premiere of the the song that was some hype shit right so i, I i'm in fr i i i cross fucking rizza i'm all nervous like a fucking nerd and i i'm like yeah rizza i know kinetic nine so I, yeah kinetic nine's my man i say yeah uh i did a rap song with him like i do like total nerd i, I was like yeah yeah do a little rapping. I said, I said, I do a little rapping like a fucking <laughs> dweeb. Oh, and then he amazing. just, I did a rap song with him. I do a little rapping like a fucking geek, dude, all nervous. And then he's just like laugh a little bit. He's like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Like probably not believing me at all. <laughs> so every time I pass next to him, I'm saying some stupid shit, dude. But he was cool. He was super nice, man. Then fucking uh, Capadonna comes in. Capadonna's pretty big, you know, he's a pretty massive guy, tall. Comes in, he's like, yo, oh, yo, oh, what's up? It smells like a high school cafeteria in here. What are we eating? I'm like, I hear that voice, man, that rugged voice. I'm like, Capadonna. He's like, yeah. I'm like, dude, welcome. He's like, a burger bar, this and that. And like, oh, cool, cool. And he sits down on his own, starts eating. Fifteen minutes later... He's like, Do you, did you cook all this? I'm like, hell yeah, I cooked all this. That's fucking good. You did a good job. I said, yeah, well, you know, I tried my best for the best. He said, you did your best, man. You know, dude, those fucking phrases, I'm going to remember till I die, man. These little phrases, you know, these little interactions as a super fan. Then fucking Chef comes in. He's all short, man. He's all short and round and cute. <laughs> Chef comes in <laughs> with his big smile. He's the smiliest guy. I'm like, chef. he comes in, I freeze. I'm like, chef. He's like, hey, hey, how you doing, man? I'm like, good. He said, oh, what are we eating at? He said, we're eating burgers. Cool, awesome, this and that. And then he's serving, him, and I'm just kind of standing there next to the door looking around. <laughs> and then my dishwasher is not, at that point, is next to me, and he's like, holy shit, that's rec one, you know? And then... Uh, He's like, this is nice. This is a nice buffet. This is, this is, this is high class. This is good, man. He said, I like this. A lot of stuff. And then he looks at me. He says, I have my vest. It says chef on it. The raquette, nice uh, designer vest. And then uh, he says, are you the chef? This is the chef talking to me. I said, are you the chef? He said, are you the chef? He said, yeah, I'm the chef. He said, you look like a chef. Dude, the chef tells me you look like a chef. I'm like, thanks, man. Can I have a picture with you? <laughs> Yeah, man, no problem. 
I take a picture with the chef. <laughs> I'm like, this is out of this fuck, this fucking world. I'm a chef, huge fan of Wu Tang. I'm taking a fucking picture with Rec One, the chef that just told me I'm the chef. <laughs> I can amazing. die, dude. I can fucking die, you know. Last person that I had a, a real interaction with is Ghostface Killer. He's one of the fucking like strongest members of the Wu Tang, you know. And so constant, so many classic albums, dude. And he's a big fucking guy. So he comes in, only person with security. I'm like, okay, shit, shit is serious. Comes in, I'm like, Ghostface. He's like, hey, how you doing? I'm like, good, good, welcome, Montreal. This is the food, if you need anything, tell me this and that. And then uh, he serves, he's kind of, seems on a little bit on the phone, a little bit in, in his, his mind and stuff. He does his thing. He eats, his security is standing in the, the doorway. Uh, I come back, and uh, uh, at this point, I, I, I made Chef uh, sign the album. <laughs> also, I wanted those signatures. So Chef uh, signed the album, Cap signed the album at this point, YDB signed the album at this point. I had asked Rizzo, he told tell me to wait, so I wait. Uh, I want that, too. I'm solely fucking geeking out. And then uh, I come back. I, fi I think he's finished, because his plate is on the side and he seems finished goes so i'm like uh excuse me ghostface you think you can sign my album <laughs> like a fucking 12 year old kid and then he's like i'm eating man <laughs> i'm eating man after i'm like oh, oh shit i'm sorry i didn't want to barter you know <laughs> and he's like no no problem it's just like i don't want to get your your vinyl dirty and shit i'm like okay it's cool he said i'll let you know i'm like okay <laughs> and then i i just feel bad for a moment i'm like oh fuck I fucking disturbed him, you know. And then uh, whatever, back and forth, back and forth. Go back to the bring something into the buffet. Dude is pushes his fucking chair. He's like all spread out and shit. Fucking ghost face killer. Then he looks at me and he says, "You ready, boss?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm like a fucking ten year old child. I'm like. Yes, yes, and I just go run, get my vinyl, and he signs the vinyl. <laughs> Fuck, man. So that's that. I, I don't see the other guys. They're in their buses or whatever. And uh, so I see these five guys, which is huge. And then uh, they, got, they leave, they do a sound check, they come back for supper. Okay, this is the moment, man. So it's like uh, ratatouille, all these vegetables and lasagna, veg veggie, and all that, the vegan guys. And then... They eat, some people eat, some people from the staff, there's less of them at that point. And then Rizza comes at last minute, and he has all, and he's the general, and he has all his gear on with his nice jewelry and shit, looking sharp. And he comes real quick, and then uh, he comes to see me. He says, he says, hey, uh, hey, chef, uh, you still have some of uh, those Beyond Meat burgers? And, uh, and we changed the menu, right? But on the, on the fucking, the, uh, in the fucking dishwasher zone, uh, right next to the garbage, there's some Beyond Meat burgers. But they're supposed to be in the garbage because I can't leave. I can't give food that's three, four hours old. I'm going to poison the fucking Wu-Tang Clan. So then I'm like, this is the moment where the RZA asks me for something that he wants, you know? <laughs> He's like, hey, chef, do you, you still have those Beyond Meat burgers? And I, I'm like... I. I'm fucking, my, I'm ripped. My soul is ripped apart. I'm just like, uh, no, man. No, man, I'm sorry. We have a ratatouille and some vegan uh, lasagna and all this stuff. Like, yeah, I really wanted to be on burger, you know? And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. We changed the menu. He said, you don't have any more in the back? I said, no, I cooked everything, you know? And then he looks in the dishwasher section, and then he's like, what about those? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like... I'm, a, I'm like, feels so bad, dude. I'm saying no to, like, one of my idols, dude. And I'm like, they're supposed to be in the garbage. I'm really sorry. I, I can't give you those. I don't want to, you to be sick, man. He's like, okay, fair, fair. That's good. No problem, man. And then I ask him, you think you can sign my vinyl? <laughs> After denying him a Beyond Burger, dude. He's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's way less enthused than you want in this moment. <laughs> Dude, that was the day I knew I could fucking die after that, man. That was the best it could get in kitchen. 
I think single handedly that is the longest single story. Yo, Chris used the whole thing as a clip. We're already on the Wu Tang blog one time. They might put that clip on the Wu Tang blog. <laughs> um, the whole thing is a clip. Though. It's amazing, dude. It is really one of it was incredibly entertaining to listen to. Your passion just carries it. Like you can't that was like nobody can really with that much detail describe one of the best moments of their lives in my opinion like nobody can <laughs> until we get lucky likes but how many of us like really get the opportunity to make food for the wu-tang clan get complimented yeah. by the wu-tang clan yeah. interact with them have all these goofy moments because you're, you're stuck with them right like it's not even <laughs> let's say they got completely sour you're still spending the rest of the day with the Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> That's amazing. The RZA one, too. Dude, I was, wasn't expecting RZA to poke his head behind and to look for the fucking burgers. Like, oh, my gosh. Do you have the record? I know you probably don't have it with yeah, you, but you I still have, have it? it. Yeah, it's on my wall. I put it uh, in a frame, yeah. You got those five signatures on it. It's cool because I could have got all the signatures, but I got the signatures of the people I actually interacted with, you know? I have moments with. That's special, so, man. Yeah, so I know it's, it's probably not going to be anywhere near as exciting as the Wu-Tang Clan. But who else did you get to interact with? I got one that's pretty cool. So, uh, oh, there was a lot, man. There, but interacting, my my second best is, uh, so Lauren Hill comes, and she's it's in, a, in the, she's doing like a hip-hop kind of festival. There's some stuff in the street going on. Lauren Hill in the uh, stadium. And last minute, like last couple of days before, they book Eric B and Rakim to open up for her. Oh, so nice. this is yeah. So this is like fucking twenty years plus that Rakim and Eric B did not perform together because they split, right? So he's the god, fucking he's Rakim Allah the God. Any fucking MC for my generation and even the new well, maybe not the young young guys, but a lot of people will put them put him in the top five. A lot of people will say He's the one of the most influentials that really fucking changed hip hop forever, you know. And he's one of the best lyricists. So I was excited about that, man. I'm like fucking Rakim, dude. That's that's special, dude. So fuck, he he was there before I got into hip hop, man. Yeah, he changed everything. So that's that. Uh, I I had that interaction with Lauren Hill. There's not a lot of people in the cafeteria. Then Rakim and Eric B get there a little later, and they're not coming to the cafeteria. They're in their private uh, artist lodge, and uh, they want a hot meal brought to them. So I have the hot meal prepared, and then I, I leave with the, the waitress, with my little trolley, and I enter the artist lodge, and there's fucking Eric B that's on the side with some other guy, like their tech guy or something. He's on the side. And then right in, standing in the middle of the room is Rakim. And you can't miss Rakim. He's so recognizable, you know. And I just, like, again, mesmerized, man, and, like, humbled. And uh, I, 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 I get into the room with the trolley, with the food. I say, uh, Rakim Allah, welcome to Montreal. It's an honor. And then he's like, thank you, thank you. It's my pleasure. And I'm like, shit you know in my mind then i bring i bring the to the hot table the the, the food with the trolley and rakim's waiting not far from me and i bring the food and in one rotation from bringing it out of my trolley and turning to put it in the hot table i say i look at rakim in one rotation and i say critic critics and biters don't know where my source of light is still leave authors and writers with all the writers and I say, that's one of the best lines in hip-hop history ever. And then he's like, ha, 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 thank you, thank you. Then he knows I'm a fucking super fan. I quote him. I fucking rapped one of my favorite lines that was hugely influential, that made me think, like, the universe, you know? To Rakim. I was like, whoa. And I say, can I have a picture with you, man? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah, sure. And I start shaking, dude. And then... <laughs> Then I give my camera to the waitress. I'm like, take this picture. This guy's like so fucking legendary. And uh, you can see the picture on Instagram, and we're kind of holding hands, you know. And um, 
and I'm shaking like a motherfucker. I'm holding his hand, and I'm like, <laughs> and looking at the camera, and he's looking at the camera, and then I whisper, I'm sorry, I'm shaking. <laughs> <laughs> and she takes the picture. The picture is really good. And then when I'm going to leave the room, Eric B. looks at me, and he's like, hey, come here. And then <laughs> I'm like, yeah, can I get you anything? Anything you need, dude? Can you find some weed, man? <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like fucking, because I'm that point, I mean, I'm smoking every fucking day. I have an ounce at home. I'm like, fuck, I don't bring weed at work. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, fuck. The day that, you know, the person, that, the day that someone asked me, I'm like, uh, well, I'll try to find you some. And, and then I kind of ask people that I can't really mix that shit in my work, you know? I kind of ask the cleaners of the place if they have weed or something. Then I, I cross him two more times before the show. And he's like, do you find that weed, man? I'm like, dude, no, sorry, I've been asking people. I can't find any. He's like, oh, okay, okay. Then he does the show. They're opening up. I was on the side of the stage for the whole show. I finished my at that point. So I'm on the side of the stage for the whole show. It's classic fucking Eric Bean Rakim, dude. It's like so sick. Follow the leader, all that shit. And then the show finishes, all that. I go clean up in the kitchen. I'm leaving. And when I'm leaving, Eric B is smoking a joint with someone, like a sound tech. And he's like, oh, it's all good, man. I found some. Thanks anyway. The food was good. All right, cool, man. <laughs> I'm like... That's pretty incredible, though. <laughs> That's incredible. That's, so again, so... like two two times, man. I have like people I really admire ask me for something, and I have to say no. You know, <laughs> it feels bad, man. <laughs> I can see how it feels bad, and it's a complicated thing. Um, <laughs> you don't want to lose the job over like, well, Eric B wanted weed. <laughs> I exactly. guess Bell, I guess Plas Bell riders don't come with weed. <laughs> <laughs> they should. It's legal, fuck. Was it legal? Though? I mean, yeah, I guess. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. Yeah. 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 That's that's amazing. Um, I don't know who else you met that was fascinating from that era, but like, you, you just tell these stories really fucking well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had some good times there. Um, sure. So yeah, then COVID comes and messes yeah. messes that up, I guess. Yeah, that was the end of that that journey. But it is what it is. I mean, it's good. Since then, I mean, uh, COVID comes. Well, uh, to, to to transition to that the end of the story. So, uh, 2013, I released uh, Keep on the Line. 2013, I sell everything I own. I'm living in a, in a condo in St. Henry. I have a dope fucking sports car. It's a Datsun 280ZX1980, 10th anniversary. You can check that on the Instagram. So I have everything materialistic that I kind of want, and I'm sad and shit, and I'm doing this uh, fucking keep on the line thing. It's a concept album, and I'm like, fuck material, you know? And uh, I go play a Shambhala festival in BC, which is like the biggest non-sponsor corporate uh, festival in Canada. Some hippie shit for five days. There's like fucking 25,000 people in this valley. It's fucking sick. Shambhala festival. Now that's the first place I played. It was kind of like the demo of the album to come. So I had five songs. I was go doing that album. I played there. And I come back from there, I have five songs. In that journey of uh, like a week, I write five songs. So I write basically the whole, the rest of the album in that journey. And I have this very great experience with this kind of spiritual music, electro uh, music festival, uh, a lot of free living, like the nudist, uh, techno geeks, furries. Uh, hip hoppers, uh, just name it. Everyone is there, and everyone was fucking free with no judgment and no corpor corporations. It was just a beautiful thing. And I did a little show with this collective. I was this activism artist collective. And I come back from there uh, super inspired. I write the whole Keep on the Line album, except for the title, the main track that I knew the title was Keep on the Line. 
and I decide I'm going to sell everything I, I, I own. I decide that's bullshit. So within that that year, so uh, September 2012 to the release of Keep on the Line in June, I sell and give away everything I have. And finally, a couple of days before my lease comes out, I had already launched the album. I trade that sports car for a camper, a 15-foot uh, Westphalia from the 80s. I leave with my cat and uh, my boxes of CDs and some clothes and some uh, a PA. I can like play. I can set up a PA and DJ or play music out of my camper. And I leave and I go to see my mom like in Bas Saint Laurent, seven hours from Montreal in the east near Gaspésie. And I go there. I'm supposed to stay there for a week. Someone hits my fucking camper, and I'm stuck there. And the insurance is complicated and all that. And I'm stuck there for the summer. So I work there in a kitchen in this fucking English garden epic place. And during that time, I'm super isolated. I'm supposed to be touring Canada independently and fucking playing out of a camper that's some hippie shit, right? And I'm stuck there. I don't have my camper anymore. So I have to turn around and do that then twitter is coming out so i'm like what the fuck is this twitter so i get on twitter and i see that you can contact people directly that are pretty known you know so i'm like shit i'll just i'll just put some energy into my relations on on the internet and i already have an album to promote so i can do that shit so that's it i fucking uh hook up with this french rapper uh, some black power activism uh neg lyrical of a couple of songs with him uh, Martin Niquet from Paris, we do some stuff. I hook up with Kinetic Nine from Kill Army Wu Tang, and I do an EP Sound Barriers, the seven songs. I, I, I write the whole thing, and I, I, can, I, I hook up while I'm uh, working and living with my moms, man, and for like a four months period. Come back, I got the camper fixed up. I go up, up uh, all around Quebec, come back to Montreal, go see Alex Blaine in the studio record seven songs in five days, sleeping in my camper and parkings, and then I leave. And that's sound barriers. And then I cross the whole fucking country, go to BC, and uh, it's in December two, 2013, so I had released in June 2013 the first album, then I released the second one in December. And uh, at that point, I was kind of like uh, trying to integrate myself in my, my BC living. I was still living in the camper, very minimalistic living, uh, pretty poor. And uh, yeah, I got I, that album came out, made some friends, had a good time, worked a lot, sold the camper, lived for fucking four years with my backpack. And a locker in Montreal, a locker in uh, Vancouver, renting ha renting furnished apartments. No telephone. It was just like off the grid kind of thing. When when you're supposed to be promoting and shit and that, and they, no, I'm just off the grid, dude. I'm like fuck it. But still, my shit is is out there. It's out there, so I can talk about it. I can hook up with people. I can make some internet moves. And that's that. And then uh, basically. 2014, I uh, kind of have this spiritual fucking awaken, and I work on what divine is, and uh, I want to do like my spiritual opus and something that I believe uh, can be very inspirational as an album and very complex musically, very large, and a lot of musicians that will be on this album. I uh, I'm working with Alex Blaine on all these projects I'm talking about. And then basically, uh, we, we start working on this, uh, this uh, What Divine Is album. After like four months of work, I'm back in Montreal. After four months of working on this album and uh, going through motions in my mind, uh, I decide to go to a Vipassana silent retreat of 10 days of meditation. So you're basically meditating six to seven hours a day for 10 days in total silence. You cannot write. You cannot... You cannot uh, talk. You cannot uh, do anything else than you eat in the morning, you eat noon, you fast for the rest of the day, you meditate one hour period six or seven times a day, you go back to sleep. You can't. You cannot communicate anyway. It was very hard. It was like a boot camp of meditation. Your body goes through stuff. Your mind goes through stuff. I'm, I'm having lucid dreams. I'm having 
all types of of stuff is getting resolved in my 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 spirit and in my mind and i come out of there and oh when we break silence everyone goes to the cafeteria and they start talking and i go straight next to the meditation hall like alone and i write a song uh and the it's called liberation it's on what divine is i featured the j manifest on that one i write that song i had composed in my mind three days before and i could not write it and i was like i I hope I can remember this because it's very much what I feel. And it's a good poetry, you know? So I fucking, I kept it. I kept it. And then I write that song. I come back from there and I'm like kind of transformed. I'm very, and I'm not, I'm detoxed from everything. That goes on for like six months. And I meditate for like a good six months, uh, at least one hour a day in the morning, sometimes at night. And I'm keeping it because I want to get, 100% 100% into this concept, again, talking about concept albums. And uh, I come back and I call my, my producer, Alex Blaine, and I say, hey, you know that album we've been working on? He's like, yeah. Well, shit changed. <laughs> I said, uh, pretty much going to scrap everything. <laughs> so basically, I'm rewriting everything except for the song, What Divine Is, which I wrote in Vancouver, which was like the flame of the whole thing, the spark, right? That, that was a, another special moment. I said, except for that song, I'm rewriting the whole album. And it's cool for you because we're going to keep all the beats, except for that beat. But we have to re-record everything, and it's probably going to take another six, seven months to do this album. So I finished fucking doing that album. It comes out in 2015. And uh, I worked a year on that album, and it was pretty fucking pretty complex mu- musically. We went a lot of places. There's the horn sections, lots and percussions, scratch, full band, upright bass on some songs, violin on some songs, uh, theremin. Uh, there's a lot of shit going on. A lot of fucking different concepts. And uh, we did a great launch with, uh, well, we got Blue Rum 13 on the title track, which was amazing. Probably to this day my best collaboration. He really, he really was touched by it. what the line is, that song. We did a video. We did the launch with him, with the full band. There's some videos on YouTube of, of that, that show. Uh, Billy Kuhn on Mont Royal. And, uh, yeah, that was the last really, really big project I did, you know. And uh, from there, I mean, I worked uh, with uh, Black's Experience a lot. Uh, we did two punk albums and a bunch of collaboration tracks. Just released a lot of shit, man. That's it. All the way to uh, fucking uh, COVID, where I, I, I turn around and I say, I don't, I'm not working, this and that, and then I did Step. So Step's my last thing. And that's pretty much the journey. There's more, but I mean, there's always more. <laughs> so so what, do you, what are you doing post-chef life? Yeah, so that's it. Well, I was, I mean, I have friends, I have restaurants, you know, and so many fucking chef friends and all that, and I was pretty saddened by how... Uh, I think the government kind of like targeted and persecuted restaurant owners and restaurants and they got fucked, you know, and uh, now I'm kind of stuck and I'd question myself on my, my job for a long time, you know, and it's like after Wu-Tang working, you go, <laughs> and no, it gets hard, you know, it gets hard as a job and uh, maybe I want to try something else. I never had the guts to go to school, but uh, <clears throat> I don't like school. But then I'm stuck in COVID, so first I'm a little fucking confused and depressed like everyone, a couple months. Then I do a song uh, called Distance. That's on my SoundCloud with my cousin did the beat. It's like an electro, really cool song, actually, that kind of motivated me. Then I come back, I'm like, ah, I have to do music. So I finish the Step album. I start working on that. I had started working on that uh, a year before I put it aside because that was a family concept album it was about relations about family i was a stepfather to a young child and from one year old to three years old and i wanted to express that you know that became the breakup and other stuff so that became with itself another concept album and i did that and i was doing food trucks i had been doing food trucks in the summertime so i liked that lifestyle a lot i had worked with the campers and shit so one day i'm doing this food truck last summer and I'm in traffic, and I sold these truckers with the big rigs. 
and my mind just tells me like, hey Alex, what do you like better, cooking or driving? I'm in the car right now, you know. I say I like better driving. He says you should be a fucking trucker, man. You know, you should. You like life on the road. You like road trips. You should be a trucker. So yeah, 44 years old, man. I decided to go do a five-month trucking program. I just graduated. I just finished. I'm gonna start my my first job now. Fucking awesome. Still doing music too. That's cool. Yeah, that's like a big story, though. <clears throat> So to recap, you start off traveling the world on some import export stuff with your parent your mom and you're doing a whole bunch of stuff in the Anglo community. Then you get thrown into the Franco community after living in Miami, I believe. You spent a year there too. Then in there your whole world gets kinda of thrown into a whole different direction over Quebec politics. <laughs> and then you get ingratiated into music because of a Jackson 5 concert where your mom finagled your way into like this wonderful fucking spot where you just got the whole fucking experience. Yeah. This leads you on this like fucking journey <laughs> where you just end up fucking learning guitar and playing in bands, get bored of that shit, go down the fucking, uh, wow, fucking skateboarding for a while, snowboarding. Like, these are all things, right? That's just the beginning part. Then you get into music for real, where you're, like, fucking pivotal in live music, hip-hop performances in the city. Whatever anyone says back then. In fact, is, if you did it then, it helped to create the now. And there are definitely live band hip-hop experiences today. And you did that shit with the jazz folks. Then you moved into, like, the fucking funk stuff, I believe. And, like... We all, us, yo, I remember the fuck you part of the story too. Like, you just became a fuck you band. Like, and you pulled that off because that was also something you were able to do. Man, and then it just, like, just is migration into the solo career with the chefing and all that. It's like, it's a pretty, like, full story that just ends in there, like, and now I'm a trucker who makes music. <laughs> Dude, you're fucking awesome. Thank you, man. I never talked so long to someone in such in depth. I, this could be a movie. Someone could script this right now and we could. You know, we could uh, fucking put some actors into this, and this would be an entertaining movie, man. Yeah, for sure. And I, I mean, I don't know. I feel like that's the thing. It's like there's a lot of people in this scene, right? But if you were to ask people how many people are in this scene, everybody guesses a number that's nowhere near as big as I think it is. And that's just my my opinion. Uh, just looking at the data of the situation, there's so many pockets. There's so many boroughs. Like there are 150,000 people in NDG. And I think LaSalle's a little bigger. Those are just two boroughs, right? Like, just these are bigger than entire fucking hip hop scenes of like buffaloes and shits, you know? Like, just like to have context for like how many humans actually live in this area. And as I hear all these stories, I think there's a little bit of an issue of pride and self confidence in Montreal and believing in ourselves for what is possible or what can be done. And I think part of it is if you try to Google this shit, Good, for, especially in English. I don't know what the fuck exists in French, but I know there's a lot more of it. So in English, how do you find that pride in your city if you can't even find the history of the city? So like to be able to hear you describe a lot of that stuff, even like I must be real. How many of us were curious about food at the at Place Bell and shit? I was curious. I never thought about fucking chefing up with artists. Like, I have one question about that. Did you get a lot of like weird requests from them or was it like a generalized thing? Because I forgot to ask that while we were there, but shit, that's been on my mind too. It's not so weird. It's, I think the days of the, oh, I'm generalizing maybe, it was my experience. I think the days of sex, drugs, rock and roll are a little behind us. I, what what was like more healthy living by, uh, you know, like... Uh, bio this and that and veganism and that, that was a lot of the demand uh, oh Aesop Rocky asked us for 50 white bath towels so I don't know if he brought his own lube but I think he had an orgy or something <laughs> but uh, no uh, nothing super weird I mean some nice bottles nice bottles of liquor and yeah a lot of healthy living a lot of healthy eating if you don't always expect that but it's more and more and of course, like guys like Wu Tang or even Offspring or that, they've been doing it for so long. I mean, of course they're healthy living at this point because they're still alive, you know. But no, nothing like really crazy. Really, nothing. Not in my experience. And even 
I would have heard about it if I didn't see it. So. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That's not that, that crazy. I think times are different, man. And like, I mean, everyone's so like uh, scrutinized now with all the internet and different, uh, different apps and the social media. I think more than ever now, I think if you're in a public figure, you kind of have to be a little careful also. And, uh, That's but, uh, in general, That's I think a... people are pretty cool. I never had also an asshole experience. I have a leave me to my space experience, but that's just normal. I never had an asshole experience, really. No, that's, that's good to hear, though. And it's interesting to think that everybody in the professional world is driven towards health. Now, now why I say that is because I have this like idea in my mind that sometimes people aren't trying to replicate the big leagues so much as they're trying to be the thing you do after the big leagues sometimes. So the Wu-Tang show ends at 11. The next show is going to be ready to go kind of thing. But if you look at the big leagues, it's like fucking healthy. It's fucking 7 to like 11. It's like all these things where it's like they're not really parties so much as giant corporate events. Like it's almost like a work conference in terms of tone. Yeah. And that's a fascinating thing for me because like I'm just trying to figure like how do you create a culture that will actually attract money? Not, not, not just like I'm talking about like people who want to just throw money at your shit. Probably has to be healthy. That's the one thing I would take away yeah. from that. I mean, music. If you talk at the beginning of this journey, we're talking about around eighty one, eighty three, Thriller. You know, that's the best selling album in all time, and and never again will those sales be matched, man. Because today. People don't buy that much music. There's a lot of illegal do downloading. There's a lot of streaming. There's not a lot of revenue from your actual product of music. So you you get revenue from from publicity, and everyone endorses products also. And it's a live concert. And now with the fucking last year of COVID, man, like these even these legendary acts, a lot of people, man, like Capadonna and shit, they counted on those fucking tours. You know, they have a lot of kids and shit. Mm -hmm. I, I just I, I just want to see fucking shows again, you know, like like especially now artists need to do fucking live music. It's it's the biggest money cow out it's out there. Like they don't make that much music with their their music with their actual song. I mean the biggest ones do. Of course Jay Z and this and that, but you know? A guy like fucking let's say Aesop Rock, you know? The Delta Zelda Funk, you know, those guys, man, they make money with their fucking tours in small and medium venues, you know, they don't have a big endorsement, they don't, so I mean, especially for fucking hip-hop, that's the heart of hip-hop, that's the, that's the best people, man, in hip-hop, we, we need to bring that stuff back, man, the festivals and the, those little medium shows, we really need to bring that back, man. I definitely think it's coming, I mean, we're in a green zone now give it yeah. like what everybody i just got an email saying hey buddy why don't you schedule your second vaccination a little bit earlier just get that a little bit earlier so we can get this shit running a little bit faster come on buddy we just need to get everybody at the two vaxes so we can flick a switch um and i mean that i'm pretty sure that's what quebec's doing right now because i'm pretty sure quebec also really wants that i know like well, Montreal is an election this year, so depending on who wins that election will greatly impact um, this exact topic. So y'all in Montreal should probably fucking pay attention to your local politics if you give a shit about like your local music scene, because yeah, it's it's gonna matter actually. Um, anyway, I appreciated having you here, cause man, like I said, going into depth with people who were there and who saw things, or even learning about how you could like sample off of VHSs back in the day and that kind of ingenuity, it's just like inspiring and doing what we can to document the history of the scene across the stories of people is the best thing I can do to do something. <laughs> it's the best uh, thing I fucking, can bring to it. Fucking awesome, man! Thank you a lot, bro. And, uh, um, really great 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 and i appreciate having you here i appreciate also just uh do you have any like thing you want to like plug last minute type thing as we like do the wrap up part all your links are in the description slash i've been yeah, popping up the whole time I mean, if people uh, are on spotify like follow me you know if you if you buy music well maybe encourage me if, if you want to something you 
maybe not the last album set, but all the other albums actually. After like a year of my release, usually I put it free on SoundCloud. So SoundCloud has all my songs from uh, Keep on the Line, Sound Barriers, What Divine Is as a free download. So uh, that's a gift to the people if they want that. And they can follow me on Instagram and they can follow my, my YouTube. They can check my video for new ones. And just, it doesn't matter that, that much the popularity. I, I just want people to connect with the art, with the music. So maybe take the time to listen to someone else, you know? And I appreciate that. Ismail asked uh, if you're working on new music. Uh, not at the moment because it's been a, a lot about the school. Uh, actually, I am, but uh, that will be probably more. Uh, it's a band. I mean, now uh, I did a collabo with a band a year ago. Uh, they're called Tribal Bones. Uh, they're a heavy metal band, actually, because <laughs> I did punk in, in other stuff too, right? So Black Experience has on the Bandcamp uh, two, two punk albums, and uh, I sing a lot on that shit. I'm old school punk, and then I did this collabo. Uh, it's not released yet uh, with Tribal Bones, um, and then they invited me in their band because they loved it. So I guess the direction is going still metal, but it's a little bit of that rap core influence and different stuff. Get it. <clears throat> so we're gonna uh, do an EP this summer. We have our songs ready. We're gonna go in studio with Alex Lane, and I guess maybe October, November. Tribal Bones will be like the new format with me uh, singing in the band. So yeah, that's different. People like some harder shit, metal yeah, That's stuff. my cup of tea. Very much my cup of tea. That's it for me. Like I said, talking to, like that darker hip hop, but also Rage Against the Machine, all that, that's big influences for me, you know? And it's he, like tripping up as a guitar player on Slayer and stuff. That I have that influence, so. So now I can express that. It's really fun. I've been also practicing with this band every two weeks or so. So to have a band that I can physically, well, there was months we could not, but uh, to have people you can actually jam with and create with the whole as a band had been a while. It had been uh, since 2013. I had not composed in a band format, even though I have live musicians on my solo stuff. So that's uh, the next stuff to come up. Yeah, Tribal Bone. We'll have a video too. Well, I'd say check that out uh, October maybe, Tribal Bones. Yeah. That's incredible. And thank y'all for watching too, because it's always more fun. Shout out Golden Jenny from Norway. It's always fun to just see people there. For me, at least, it creates more of like a show dynamic, you know, it makes it more fun and alive. But it's just cool uh, that that happened. Shout out all the people in the future watching and the, the YouTubes or the whatever podcast thing, etc., that you're on. I uh, appreciate everyone for real, real special thanks to the patrons. It's Milk and Am, Secrets, Pat, Jonathan, Brian, CJ, Black, Hurricanes, Lindo, Williams, and Scribble, the dope support what we do. Patreon.com slash behind that suit if you want to, too. On that note, it was super great to have you here, Lucky Lex. I really enjoyed this episode. I'm going to start the raid. So live long and prosper, everyone.